So there we are. Um, aside from that, uh, we have only a few minutes until we're live, of course. So I do invite everyone to uh, speak. Uh, I, I'm sure everybody remembers my frustration the other day when for some reason, uh, as if by an unspoken agreement, I was asking people <laughs> to write out if they could hear me, uh, not people on Team Dietrich, of course, who I suspect, you know, who I, I know have a different kind of listening situation than the rest of humanity, and they tend to be able to hear me. Uh, at least they have a better chance of hearing me than people who are part of the baseline. And uh, so when I was asking people who were listeners to indicate whether or not they could hear us. I wasn't getting any responses, which was really frustrating. A bunch of people kept clicking and, uh, you know, um, uh, various like uh, reactions and, uh, but I wasn't getting anything that was uh, uh, discernibly a, uh, a uh, definitive statement. So I do ask people to actually write, I can hear you. Uh, so, uh, um, and I, um, so, dear Ramona, I believe that our chat room monitor, Ramona Halifa Henrys, hears us all loud and clear. Bless her. Okay. Uh, it's the top of the hour. I'm going to go mute. I advise everyone else to do the same. We will all um, be back, but only I will be speaking within a matter of moments. Uh, do stay there. Uh, don't go away. We're not going away. We'll all be back. We're all still here. All right, I'm certain that's disconcerting for many people to have those moments of silence. So uh, I do want to um, provide a number of people shout outs tonight. Uh, we hope to get to uh, our brother in battle, J-Mo Reese, who seems to have deactivated his Facebook timeline uh, later in the evening's uh, transmission. Uh, by the time I get to that point, we may well be in our fourth hour. Um, obviously, uh, there are a number of other people I'll be providing shout outs to. For now, we're going to do the team, as always. Uh, we start off with uh, the lovely lady who acts as our producer for live stream, and that is Rose Dio. Uh, without Rose Dio, none of this is possible. She is the lady who uh, puts it all together, makes it happen. Uh, I'm going to be asking my Maki benefactress, who I shall not name, to uh, be working very closely with her for some troubleshooting uh, that I will bring up. And uh, this will have to do uh, for, with a few minutes of explanation and background to everyone. Paul uh, uh, Edward is uh, already very familiar with what happened uh, the other night. I'm, I can't even remember what night it was now. Uh, Paul can write it into the uh, text box here in Skype as to what night I was speaking to him. Uh, everything seems like a blur lately with the number of different things that I've been dealing with. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be telling you what happened in a matter of moments. But for now, I want everyone to know that uh, Rose Dio is live streaming presentations on when she can uh, during the week on Fridays, Saturdays, and Tuesdays, or a better way to say that would be Tuesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, uh, and uh, the the way we usually think of the week and its progression. And the reason she does this is because we have three presentations uh, that are old, uh, that people have been pirating forever. Uh, there's no point in my trying to sell DVDs of these anymore. So we've taken command of the situation by just live streaming them ourselves because they serve as a introduction and an advertisement to bring in more subscribers. And the most important thing to uh, bear in mind about this entire situation is that you need to subscribe to the Mystic Warrior channel. Uh, Mystic is spelled M-Y-S-T-I-C-K, and uh, the Mystic Warrior channel, spelled with a K, is uh, not just something that you subscribe to, uh, but you need to tap the notification bell. Now, this is what I need to emphasize. Click on that notification bell, and then, and only then, you will receive notifications that live streams have started. Now, the live streams will tend to start when I'm not live streaming live, the live streams will tend to start uh, in um, Tuesdays, Saturdays, and Fridays for my original presentations of Roswell and the Rising Sun and Satan's Crusaders. There are two different original presentations of Roswell and the Rising Sun. And there is one original presentation of Satan's Crusaders, 
all of these are what we'll be live streaming uh, during the week on Tuesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. And uh, they'll start at different times, usually fairly early in the morning, and they'll end at different times, usually on the eventide, uh, per whatever is going on with Rose Dio's schedule and whatever uh, challenges she's facing. Now, I've gotten some uh, notifications from uh, the um, gentlemen who are with us, so I'm going to refresh. And there, I've got my messages coming in whenever I refresh the text box. We talked Friday night. Thank you, Paul. And I deeply appreciate that audio stream coming through. Well, good. And uh, we're being heard from here, too. Good. Uh, thank you to Daniel and Paul Edward. Uh, and, of course, those are two gentlemen. I will now take the time to give a shout out to. Uh, these are our brothers in battle. These are uh, the Minutemen of... Uh, uh, Team Dietrich, and they uh, answer that call to battle, uh, bearing arms uh, whenever called upon, and uh, it's deeply appreciated. Uh, then they do so right away uh, to the best of their ability when they're able to do so. And of course, want to give a shout out to the Grand Madam Ramona Halitha Henry, who serves not only as a sponsor, but also as the uh, monitor of the closest thing we have to a chat room, which is my personal friends page on Facebook, uh, where uh, she establishes a thread and then puts many links on that thread to verify what I'm saying. I also invite her to um, do that on my promotional banner. Um, and um, I think that way she will probably get much more responses to what she uh, enters as a thread because many more people will probably link to either the promotional banner or to a live link. That might be the better place on which to put the links that uh, she shares with us that verify uh, my uh, whatever I bring up or or tend to reinforce it, and uh, which is a invaluable service on her part. I don't think enough people, nearly enough, are taking advantage of it. We have some very uh, alert followers like Sarah Shields. Mm, shout out to that lovely lady who do take advantage of that. Uh, we need a lot more people to actually look at what Rose Dio is, is sharing with us. So probably the best way to do that would be on the live link as opposed to the link she herself establishes, which is kind of just a feed back to us uh, on the uh, on the chat page, uh, the Facebook timeline and uh, just suggestion. And uh, in the interim, uh, all love and light to uh, our dear uh, Grand Madam Ramona Halitha Henry. Uh, now, I'm fairly weary. Um, the uh, Veterans Day, of course, is uh, not a positive day for myself. I don't have uh, pleasant memories uh, associated with it. And, uh, and of course, I don't uh, uh, really affiliate with veterans uh, at this point in my life in any way, shape or form. And uh, will do so less and less as my life moves on. Uh, and of course, I advocate very very much in radically rehabilitating uh, the entire system, uh, which, of course, uh, it just reinforces all of their psychoses and their neuroses and their pathologies and their dysfunctions. So uh, obviously, I'm not going to be popular for that reason with veterans who thrive on this parasitism. And that's what it is. It's a parasitism. And I'll explain why as we move on during the transmission, uh, though I'm not going to overdwell on veterans because they really don't deserve the attention. Now, this is Veterans Day. And they should have the attention. They get attention every goddamn day. And uh, the point is they're getting too damn much of it and they want more, which is what leads to mass shootings uh, like we've recently experienced. Uh, the point is, just to get it out of the way, since I've talked about the scheduling for live streams such as it is, is to uh, remind people that the United States of America as a constitutional republic is not supposed to be a giant uh, holding house for veterans of foreign wars. This is supposed to be a army and Navy and armed services in general that is fronting citizens as soldiers. This is why for the overwhelming majority of American history, we had a fucking draft. Uh, the worst thing that ever happened to the United States of America was the disillusion of that goddamn draft. Once that was gotten away with, uh, done away with, we were left with nothing but fighting fools and thinking cowards. Now, I myself had a part in the dissolution of that draft over time. Uh, in terms of that, that was my hemorrhaging facts about the original draft. Now, make no mistake about it, the draft was cut before I became a player in any kind of information program. Uh, but in terms of what happened with veterans' benefits, 
the way I benefited many, many veterans was the fact that none of them could get any benefits. And much of this was due to the fact that they had less than honorable discharges or discharges that were in one way or another altered by SPNs or separation program numbers. And these were numbers that had nothing to do with their behavior in real life. They were capriciously and malevolently chosen or assigned by their commanding officers to make certain they would never be employed. And this is why so many veterans from the Vietnam era are homeless, as well as many veterans from the Korean War era are homeless. The World War II veterans aren't homeless because they've, at this age, been shoved into a home, either off the streets or out of wherever they were. Um, so the majority of veterans that are still functional and able to visit uh, various uh, assemblies, uh, conferences and the like, uh, attend VFW or Veterans of Foreign Wars parades or gathering. Uh, these are veterans who are, of course, uh, Korean War era veterans at the oldest uh, in general, unless they're uh, you know, just rolled up in a wheelchair for a special ceremony or something like that. Uh, so other veterans would tend to be from Marie Vietnam there are not that many veterans participating in such social gatherings from uh, the Afghanistan or Iraq era wars because most of these people spend all of their time doped up at veterans administration centers or uh, homeless and doped up uh, visiting you know, veterans administration centers. And uh, these are, of course, veterans who never had the SPN problem. These are uh, problems of an entirely different animal, an entirely different beast, an entirely different stripe. Uh, with the Vietnam era veterans, uh, what they wanted, because they were bringing it into the draft by popular demand, what they wanted was for veterans to re-enlist. And because they wanted veterans to re-enlist throughout the Vietnam War, long before they were forced to end the draft, uh, the problem with veterans was they gained combat experience during a year of service. Uh, now, of course, with your average uh, servicemen. You're talking about what amounted to only nine months, uh, three months boot camp, and then nine months of service, what was called your tour of duty. For the Marines, it was different. It was something like uh, uh, probably a full year of service. They would go through boot camp for about three months. Uh, there was specialist training, of course, with all of these branches. And then you got shoved onto the field. And uh, whether that was behind the lines or in the field, then you had another, uh, for, if you were a Marine, at least 10 months off times a year uh, in which you were deployed. So for you, it would turn out to be like 13 to 14 months of service. And uh, for other branches of service, it was only a year. Uh, so whatever you learned during that period of time, if you survived a year in Vietnam, whether you were behind the lines or whether you were in the field, of course, if you were in the field and experiencing combat, if you survived a year of combat, you were one lucky son of a bitch, especially if you were a Marine. And therefore, with that year of experience, they really were sad to see you go because they wanted you to reenlist so that you could help act as a guide, as a mentor, as a someone who would train people in the field after they came in all the newbies and you would take the noobs and help them survive. So in order to get as many people of all branches of service coming back, even if they were in the rear with the gear and the beer, uh, they learned about the technology they were deploying in communications, uh, radar, uh, whatever they were doing. Uh, in order to keep these more experienced people coming back, they made certain that they were unemployable in the civilian world. And the way that they did this would be to assign an SPN, a separation program number, that would be as, uh, it, it, as negative as possible. And it would say everything from that they were an alcoholic to that they didn't believe in God uh, to that they were a sexual deviant. Uh, and uh, these were just almost randomly or capriciously assigned by the commanding officer. And uh, the whole idea was to give everyone one of these, uh, unless you really like the individual and uh, decided to just let them go, or for some reason never wanted them back in the service, which would mean you really dislike them. So it was either end of the spectrum, either they had to be really liked or really disliked in order for you to get a fairly positive SPN number. And uh, the end result was, of course, most of these people could never be employed, but going back to Vietnam was such a horrible uh, uh, fate that none of them wanted to go back either, and none of them re-enlisted uh, demographically. Of course, there were many men who re-enlisted multiple times in Vietnam, uh, men who loved it over in Vietnam. Uh, there were plenty of people like that, uh, that that was the best experience they ever had in their lives. 
uh, with other people, the majority of them, though the overwhelming majority, that wasn't the case. So for that reason, we have an overwhelming amount of homeless veterans from Vietnam and the Korean War eras, who, of course, mostly were combat veterans who never wanted to go back into combat and would rather face a life of homelessness at home. And that was their fate. Um, with the modern day veterans of Afghanistan and Iraq, it's very different. Uh, they come back home and uh, the whole new trip since the end of the draft has been, quote unquote, the professional services in which people who go in now choose it as a career theoretically. Uh, in, in reality, it's not. For most of them, they're escaping from the ghetto. Uh, they're given false promises of education, which I could go into hours about how all of that is totally false. I mean, you, 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 you may as well not enter the service at all. Uh, the amount of money that you get towards education is simply dollar for dollar, meaning every time you put in a dollar towards your own education, then the military will put in a dollar towards your own education. There's still a cap on it. The only place you'll ever be able to afford to go is a community college. You may as well stay home. You don't need to join the military to go to a goddamn community college. So when you've got all of this going down, uh, most of the people are obviously not in the military for the education. And uh, whatever you learn in the military, almost universally, is inapplicable to civilian life. Uh, the lie, of course, is that you learn some kind of incredible technical skill that will get you, make you uh, employable when you leave the military. All of that is, for the most part, 90% of it is absolute bullshit. Uh, you go in the military, you become a repairman or a mechanic. Uh, you're not going to learn how to repair cars. You're repairing tank treads. You're repairing uh, massive swivels that require uh, pulleys to lift up uh, the, the tread turret, you know, tank turret, etc. It just goes on and on. There's nothing you learn that will be applicable in a mechanical shop back home. Uh, there's with, with almost anything in the military, there's nothing applicable to learn. Uh, these are specific uh, tasks and, and specialties. So uh, the end result is that uh, people in the military is unemployable now as they were back then, but you have an added factor. Um, these days, it's many of them uh, come back, quote unquote, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, they've done a lot to eliminate that kind of diagnosis with many of them because they don't want to issue benefits. So they have like partial PTSD or limited PTSD. They have a percentage to it. Uh, the end result is that um, these men come back home and they become welfare recipients. And uh, the, the ones that aren't given any PTSD benefits are forced to look for work uh, where they can find it. Most of them can't find it and they wind up going to jail, which is the reason they wound up in the military in the first place. It's usually a jail dodge or it's a welfare state entry. So it's just a giant welfare state now and a jail dodge uh, overwhelmingly concerning all four branches of the armed service. So in terms of all of that, in order to rehabilitate it, bring back the draft, get rid of all of the so-called professionals. The overwhelming majority of them are as unprofessional as you can get. They are people you wouldn't want anywhere uh, working flipping burgers. You wouldn't trust them to uh, deliver packages. You wouldn't trust them to do anything, but you give them guns. But of course you don't trust them with the guns, which is why they're always unarmed until it's actually time to hit the field. Then you pass out ammo. And then what they do is they kill each other, just like in prison, because that's what people do in prison. They become ethnically enclaved into various gangs. And when they have a big prison riot, they don't kill the warden. They don't kill the guards because they need them as hostages. They do kill each other. That's what happened in Desert Storm. Desert Storm was the largest deployment of Marines in the entire history of the United States Marine Corps. The entire is the largest deployment of troops. It, period. It was bigger than D-Day in terms of the troops that were on the ground. Uh, and already there in Operation Desert Shield, all assembled in the House of Saud before they moved into Iraq. And uh, this massive amount of troops was totally unarmed in terms of bullets being issued until the war began. And then they passed out the bullets. And in the entire Operation Desert Storm, you can look up the stats yourself. You can look up the demographics. Something like maybe over the years it grew. Uh, first amount of people that got killed was about uh, about a score of Marines and about a dozen Army men and one woman uh, who were behind the lines sleeping in a barracks and a Scud missile happened to hit their barracks while they were all sleeping, killed them all. And that's how it was with the Army. With the Marines, it was the Battle of al uh, where about a score of them got killed when the Iraqis counterattacked. Uh, other than that, the original 
casualties, fatalities, that is, people who got killed, uh, fatality being someone who dies, a casualty being someone who injured, gets injured, um, the original fatality ratio uh, for Operation Desert Storm was in the tens, literally in the amounts of less than less than half a hundred. Uh, over the years, as we found out more and more about the number of people who got killed, uh, it grew to about 300. Maybe at the absolute most, it might crawl towards something near half a thousand. Uh, but more than likely, it's about oh, a little over 300, 350 or so people that got killed in Operation Desert Storm on the side of the Americans. Now, aside from those 20 Marines and those 10, uh, the, you know, nine men and one woman or so, that dozen or so people that got killed behind the lines in the army, Every single one of those fatalities that brings it between 350 to about, you know, under a half a thousand that died were killed by fellow Americans. Every single one of them, not a single one of them killed by an Iraqi soldier. Not a single one, not a single one. All of them, once they were issued weapons, started blowing each other's heads off because these are men who would otherwise be in jail. They're not fit to serve in any conventional employment, let alone be turned loose with a gun. Uh, now, all of that, of course, will be violently contested. But if you look it up, the blue on blue death is what they call it. Target blue, blue on blue, friendly fire. Uh, that's what almost every single person who died in Operation Desert Storm died of. It was despicable. It was a disgrace. <laughs> it was just beyond embarrassing. It was an absolute failure in war on so many levels. And uh, the only thing that carried it through was a, the deployment of a number of highly unconventional weapons uh, that uh, I could go into for hours and hours, not the scope of anything I want to get into tonight. Other than that, the uh, my experience, of course, was that all of these veterans, once they came home, and uh, and since that point in time, all the ones deployed in Iraq in what was Gulf War II to the Americans, in reality, Gulf War III, what I was in was Gulf War II because Gulf War I was Iran versus Iraq for eight years. So uh, the Operation Desert Storm was Gulf War II, and then what the Americans call Bush War II, or the third Gulf War, uh, was actually the uh, Iraqi Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Now, Americans began seeing combat, and Americans began to die uh, on the basis of enemy fire. Now, whether it's from Desert Storm, whether it's from Operation Iraqi Freedom, all of these veterans have come home from these various deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're all turned into drama queens. And the reason why is because, oh, you didn't serve, is what they tell civilians, you'll never understand. Therefore, only I and my fellow servicemen can understand. And they're brought together at the VA, and all of them are basically indoctrinated by their psychiatric uh, counselors into becoming drama queens, where they're given all kinds of dope and drugs. And in exchange, as payment for all this dope and drugs, they cry their hearts out. They weep, they moan, they explode in rages. And of course, nothing gets done. They spend the rest of their lives doing this. This is their, this is their catharsis. This is their communion. And of course, no one can understand them but themselves. So because of that, it becomes a cult. It's all part of the cult of veteranoid life form. And as a result, they are given leeway. They are given a 007 license to kill. They can do anything they want because no one can ever understand them. No one can ever uh, relate. And therefore, uh, they're lost in their own little worlds. And uh, the way to do away with this is since none of this to any numeric extent in any statistical sense, none of this happened with World War II veterans. So what all changed from World War II, then the Korean Vietnam, and then this? Uh, World War II, of course, was the draft. Far more people who were drafted than ever volunteered. Uh, two thirds of people who served in World War II were drafted. Only a third of them volunteered. Uh, in terms of Vietnam, two thirds of the men who served volunteered. Only a third were drafted. The draft was no great shakes. It was, no big deal. It was not the decisive problem in the war. Now, in terms of uh, the response, we all know what it was based on what I said, the SPN, uh, the separation program number destroyed countless lives. That's what destroyed the Vietnam and Korean era war veterans. By the time we get to Iraq and Afghanistan, everything's changed. 
nobody's drafted. All of these people volunteered to serve. They, of course, now use this as an excuse to remain unsocialized and antisocial the rest of their lives. Okay, this is intolerable. They are now a threat to you. They're a threat to the public. And in that regard, the only way to solve the problem is to bring back the draft. And then you have the citizen soldier. That was the whole point in World War II. That's why, statistically speaking, not that it didn't happen, but statistically, overall, you never had any of these problems. In World War II, everyone's drafted, everyone comes back, and nobody can have one up on the other because everybody served. Since everybody in World War II was pretty much in uniform, since the United States Army fielded 27 million men and women in uniform, the entire Chinese Communist fucking army today has at absolute most three million in uniform. Three million. That's just orders of magnitude less than what the Americans fielded all over the world in World War II. Everybody was in uniform in World War II. So when everybody came home, no one could one up the other and say, oh, you wouldn't understand. You weren't in the war. Because everybody would just say, bullshit, I was in uniform and I was in the war. And because of that, nobody developed the complex where they could say, oh, I'm all alone. Nobody understands me. Vietnam was different for all the reasons I articulated. Now, by the time we get to the quote unquote professional army, everybody is locked in the world of compartmentalized. And because of that, the military has become a mystical cult. And everybody says, oh, the army, they do this, they do that. Oh, because Cousin Bubba tells me so. Or, well, my Uncle Benny was in the uh, Air Force and they do it like this or whatever. And everybody is working off whatever their relative or, or distant cousin or whatever in the military does. And it's all based on second hand, third hand, all that stuff. Well, do away with all that crap and do away with the mystique of the military. Then the military can't get away with all the shit it gets away with, which is taking all of your money expending it on black budget projects uh, and, of course, producing an endless sea of psychopaths. So all of that came to the fore this weekend uh, or this last week prior to the weekend, my weekend, uh, which uh, began for me on Wednesday night after I finished transmission. And after my latest transmission, there was a mass shooting involving a veteran. Now, um, one of the things that happened on uh, Friday night uh, was that I finally uh, got my uh, California state ID renewed. And uh, because I received my California state ID, I basically had to send a copy of it in order to get our new website up and running uh, to my Maki benefactress. Now, of course, uh, I went to scan it. Now, it's one thing I cannot do with my scanner at home, and I've warned people about this. Uh, first off, that was how Reality Winner was outed by the Intercept, and ultimately that led to her arrest. Whatever you do, you cannot use your own scanning machine if, like someone as myself, you have involvement with many different activities that are under the table, such as what I've dealt with the Chinese community all my life. Now, all my life, of course, I've been part of the Chinese underworld in terms of my affiliations for my survival ever since I was young and, of course, joined a Chinese gang in order to survive. I was brought in there because, of course, uh, the father of uh, my gang initiate brother, Beaver, uh, was just a low-level criminal, owned a corner store in the San Francisco Tenderloin ghetto area. And uh, he, uh, like so many of those kinds of uh, people, uh, was uh, without morals and would sell alcohol for food stamps. And when my father brought in food stamps at one point and purchased alcohol, then at that point, uh, because I was trying to combat my father's alcoholism, which he ultimately conquered to his credit, I had Beaver's father arrested. So uh, Beaver thought this was the funniest thing in the world and uh, laughed his ass off when his dad was in court, totally intimidated, and uh, later on invited me into his gang, which was, of course, what kept me alive uh, and not gang raped uh, by serving that particular underworld tongue. And uh, I often did so in drag uh, because I was the only one who could really pull it off. 
and as a result was able to do things no one else was able to do, was essentially the vanguard for many operations. And because of this kind of background, very similar to what happened with uh, Reality Winner, I can never use my home scanner because the home scanner, every single scanner that winds up in the United States that you have uh, personally or at work, all of them carry government downloaded programs to present a set of fingerprints digitally that is not visible to the naked eye, but is visible to people who are looking for those digital fingerprints at a higher level of perception using technology. And Reality Winner, who was a public informant, a whistleblower, who was unleashing various types of information, got outed by The Intercept, which totally made themselves a paper that you could no longer trust to whistleblow or or give information to. And uh, what they did was they turned over the images of her scans to the FBI, who was able to immediately identify her uh, scans as emergent from her workplace, found out she worked for the United States government. And um, she's even now still in trial, uh, will probably spend the rest of her life in jail. So her life was destroyed by that. So when I have a California ID that I'm trying to send to my Maki benefactor so I can get my new website started up and running with the help of uh, Rose Dio and my Maki benefactors working together along with uh, Paul Edward. Uh, what happened was that uh, it sent a automatic signal when I was over at uh, FedEx Kinko's and FedEx at Kinko's. When I go over there, the only way I could do this is because everyone there, the particular FedEx outlet that I go to, which used to be Kinko's copy, uh, I know the people at, who staff that particular uh, facility. And I've known them for 14 years. The manager there has been working there for 14 years. So I went over there. He knew me and uh, was kind enough to help, as they've done before with this sort of thing. And the point is they're not allowed to help you in any conventional way uh, because the big concern is document alteration. And it's just gotten worse and worse over the years. So the federal government now has... Whenever somebody is trying to just scan a photo ID card, the scanner automatically turns an alarm on to the federal government. The federal government shuts down the scanner and they will not scan or, or relay the scan electronically unless, of course, you're able to provide all kinds of evidence that, uh, that, that you are who you say you are. And uh, ultimately what happens is the manager of the facility has to make note that they cannot conventionally work with this. And uh, then what happens is the under the table operation where things are done to get it into my email box so I can finally email it to the people I need to email it to you. Uh, in this case, uh, my Maki benefactors who forwarded it to uh, Bluehost. Uh, that, of course, was the misadventure where she got the alarm and uh, that someone was trying to break into my email account, my Google account, and shut it down. So because of that, now I can't enter YouTube. <laughs> so I do need her to troubleshoot with Rose Dio so I can re-enter YouTube. Uh, the reason I want to do this is because Rose Dio has been kind enough to relay some very kind statements, one from J.M.O. Reese and another one from a pseudonym, Foxy Black. Uh, that was just uh, entered sometime today. I will read their statements out as this transmission goes on that were entered on YouTube, brought to my attention by Rose Dio. I cannot put a like on them or interact with YouTube in any way until uh, the Maki Benefactress gets together with Rose Dio and troubleshoots this. So I'll have both those ladies go in there and do that uh, later. I ask them both to do that at their convenience, uh, which is why I have to bring all this up, but it's of educational importance to the public as well. So uh, glad I was able to share that with all of you. Um, and uh, the shutdown, of course, was ultimately solved. I was able to talk with uh, uh, Paul Edward, uh, able through him to speak to my Maki benefactress, who when she shut me down on uh, Google, shut me down everywhere. Google owns YouTube. Google owns everything. I mean, she shut down the internet for me. So uh, it was through him we were able to get the inter uh, net back up for me in general, but I'm still unable to interact uh, on YouTube, like click and likes or something like that for these people that Rose Deer showed me had sent me these wonderful messages. So um, hopefully we'll be able to solve that problem. In the meantime, here's what Foxy Black said, something like about maybe eight to 10 hours ago. Mr. Dietrich, I want to say thank you for your service. I know it's rough for you around this time, but no, there are people out here that truly admire you for all you have done and continued to do three hearts. God bless you, Foxy Black, whatever your gender is.
I love you. All right. Now, um, that brings us now that we've taken the half hour to kind of catch you up on my personal uh, life, what was going on with that, uh, so we could get my Bluehost site up at least transitionally until we switch to another server, uh, which uh, Paul Edward will help us do. All of this will be done in a continuous partnership with Rose Deal and, uh, of course, my Maki benefactress acting as essentially my new uh, overall manageress. Uh, I have not yet found uh, a young lady to run receptionist for me, uh, which is why I don't get into my uh, private messages very often uh, and why I can't do any scheduling for interviews as of yet. Uh, eventually, I'm going to have to get some young lady or, or lady of any age to do that. Uh, and at that point, I've entered into kind of a uh, kind of a marriage, so to speak. Uh, but uh, because I'll have access to all my intimate information, uh, this happened before. And uh, now I'm working on a far more team oriented level. Um, so um, I'll be. I'll be going around uh, seeing what can be arranged in that regard. In the meantime, what we had was the weekend that was. California is in a state of multiple emergencies. Uh, and it brings us to all of it being political. As I've stated before, we're still counting the votes. California counties have until December 7th, uh, Pearl Harbor Memorial Day, to report their final counts. California is not goofy. It's just really fucking big. That's why the counting of the votes takes so goddamn long. California's Secretary of State's office estimated on Thursday last week that almost four and a half million votes remain to be tallied statewide. Uh, one and a half million of them in Los Angeles and Orange counties alone. About seven and a half million ballots have already been counted in the state. In California, early arriving ballots almost always favor Republicans and late arriving ballots typically favor Democrats. That's largely because younger voters tend to send their ballots at the last minute and they tend to vote Democratic. So far, two Republican held congressional seats in the state, the 49th district straddling San Diego and Orange counties and the 25th in northern Los Angeles County have flipped to the Democrats. At least two more and perhaps as many as four could flip in the final count. I have not been keeping track since last Thursday. Obviously, you saw what happened to me Friday, and that was enough to take up the whole goddamn day. Now, what the election means for California is that the newly elected governor, Gavin Newsom, is expected to intensify the state's battle with the Trump administration. On election night, Newsom said, it's been a long two years, but tonight America's biggest state is making America's biggest statement. We are saying unmistakably and in unison that it's time to roll credits on the politics of chaos and cruelty. And in San Francisco, where, of course, he was once mayor and where I met him personally as an advocate for senior care when I was caring for both of my parents, the governor-elect Gavin Newsom uh, came back to his hometown on Thursday, uh, the day before everything went haywire for me with all of the ID scanning and all that crap. Uh, and he held his first press conference since his election, notably at a homeless shelter in San Francisco's Tenderloin, the ghetto in which I grew up, the worst and most dangerous neighborhood on planet fucking Earth. And he spent much of the time criticizing gun rights advocates in the aftermath of the Thousand Oaks shooting in California. Understandably and justifiably so. We'll get more into that, the event itself. Now, here's where Newsom stands on a wide range of issues. This counts because as the leader of the resistance, he and his election are what directly triggered the arson generated fires and the mass shooting that I predicted in my transmission on Wednesday when I said they captured one white trash piece of shit. This male son of a bitch trying to drag young girls into his vehicle to use as human meat shields when he was preparing to take out an entire school in Reed, California, this bastard was intercepted. And because his operation was abortive, I said others would be coming in to take his place. And one did, and they did so the night after I was transmitting. So all of this was direct response to Gavin Newsom being elected and the resistance intensifying in my Golden Bear State of California, the engine of the American economy. Now, one constraint on the new governor is that the federal government plays a key role in many issues important to the state, including water supply and money for disaster aid. All out conflict will carry a heavy price. A central issue for Gavin Newsom will be how far to the left he wants to try to lead the state. Newsom will face pressure from Democratic Party activists who typically are more liberal than the state's voters. 
But he's also had uh, the benefit of watching Governor Jerry Brown as he spent the last eight years backing progressive causes on some fronts while restraining others, especially on policies that would have significantly expanded. Newsom has said he will take another look at California's rent control policies as part of an overall effort to try to deal with the state's extremely high housing costs. Uh, the statewide ballot measure to expand rent control has failed, but advocates plan to continue pressing the issue. Uh, the newly elected Democratic House and seven new Democratic governors will give California important allies on many of the issues on which the state has been fighting the Trump administration. And that's what triggered directly the fire and fury in Thousand Oaks. Thousand Oaks, California reels from twin tragedies, a mass shooting and a destructive wildfire. A gunman opened fire inside a bar in Thousand Oaks, California, hosting College Country Night on Wednesday last week. Uh, this was while I was transmitting on bandwidth. Didn't find out the details of it till after I was off bandwidth and off record, or I would have started giving you instant reports. None of it would have been as coherent as what I can give you now. Son of a bitch killed 12 people. Uh, I don't count him as a person. He would be number 13, but he's not a human being. He's a goddamn ex-Marine. Now, the city is one of the lowest crime cities in America. So was Parkland, where gunmen killed 17 at a high school. Mass shootings have come to every corner of American public life, from schools to malls, churches to synagogues, concerts to movie theaters, spreading like an actual pathological disease, a pathogen. And in medical terms, I will make that comparison as this transmission goes on and back it up and leaving unceasing drama in its wake of crises. It was supposed to be a night of fun. It ended in absolute horror. The victims in the mass shooting at the Borderline Bar and Grill in Thousand Oaks, California, were part of a huge crowd line dancing and having a great time up until that moment at the bar's college night. Then a fucking Marine dressed in a black trench coat and glasses, very similar to my own gang stalker who calls himself Gunner 65, who was a gunner as this man was, except of course, Gunner C5 never saw a day in combat. Uh, one of his brothers in arms, one of his uh, spiritual uh, equivalents uh, and mental and psychiatric head cases of a, of a kind, one of the men from his fold uh, came dressed up as if he were one of the trench coat mafia from the Columbine massacre, later identified as Marine Corps gunner Ian David Long opened fire when it was all over 12 kids, just kids, and a sheriff's deputy were dead. Now, this latest mass shooting feels especially painful because many of the victims were so young. Uh, college students just trying to enjoy a night out. Grief-stricken parents talked of desperately searching for their babies, only to learn their children had perished in the violence. And the nation is left once again under Donald Trump searching for answers to gun violence after enduring a fourth fucking shooting in just 14 fucking days of Fortnite, a 14 nights, two week period. The shooting's not the only calamity that folks in the area are dealing with. To put it simply, Thursday was a terrible day in Thousand Oaks, California. It began with residents of this close-knit community waking to the news of the mass shooting in their backyard. The names of the 12 children who were shot and killed at the borderline bar and grill slowly trickled out as vigils and prayer services were held throughout the community. With these grief-filled gatherings came reports of heroism. There was a Ventura County Sheriff's deputy who ran into the bar and acted as a human meat shield threw his body in front of any number of victims, gave his life, and other stories of individuals putting themselves in harm's way to save others from some filthy American Marine. But everyone with that I read of, reviewed their case of, uh, still felt a sense of profound loss, particularly when it came clear that the bar was hosting a night aimed at attracting college students seeking some fun. And then, as this town came to grips with what had happened, billowing clouds of smoke began to fill the skyline. Fast-moving wildfires sent Ventura County into a frenzy as neighborhoods were placed under mandatory evacuation and the 101 freeway was shut down. Mourners, though, were not deterred by this threat, still came out to honor the fallen. The, I remember reading in the Times of California that uh, Marisa Gerber was at the Thousand Oaks Arts Center 
uh, that night uh, as a musician began playing his viola. He swayed softly from side to side as the mourners shuffled into the theater carrying battery-powered candles. Many embraced one another in hugs, others cried softly, and then the several cell phones buzzed in unison. And many in the crowd sighed, knowing it was an amber alert level warning about the ominous orange smoke rising in the sky outside. And the message did read, emergency alert, VC sheriff, fast-moving brush fire in TO slash camp. And that 24 hours for everyone felt like an apocalypse, even those of us who were just observing it from afar. And then there were the fires and devastation in Paradise, California. A uh, fast-moving wildfire whipped through Paradise. A Northern California community of 27,000 people in Northern California near Sacramento, the capital of the Golden Bear State of California itself, burning down the city and displacing tens of thousands of people. The blaze has charged almost 10,000 acres so far that I know of, burned them in a scorched earth operation. More than 30,000 people ran for their lives as the fire swept through the Butte County town with residents of nearby Chico ordered to evacuate late night last week in Ventura County. Brush fires prompted an evacuation near Thousand Oaks, the site of Wednesday's mass shooting. Officials said at least nine people died and more than 6,700 homes and commercial buildings were lost, making it the most destructive fire to property in all California state history. And that's not the only wildfire burning in the state. About 40,000 people in Northern California evacuated to get away from the fast growing Camp Fire, Camp C County, California Fire, which has burned 20,000 acres in Butte County. The Hill and Woolsey fires have threatened several Ventura County communities and led to highway closures. Traffic gridlock made getting to evacuation centers difficult. Now wildfires are threatening other parts of the state. The National Weather Service has issued red flag fire warnings in many parts of the state. Uh, did so through Friday evening when I was having all of my problems to even get back online. So I have nowhere near uh, the information that I would like to have, but I do know 13,000 residents of the beach city Malibu have been ordered to evacuate. Uh, about those fires in Southern California, after forcing evacuations in Malibu, Topanga Canyon and hillside communities near the water, the Woolsey Fire plowed eastward into the San Fernando Valley community of West Hills, posing new dangers to residents, homes, and weary firefighters. In Malibu, the flames met the sea. The fire barreled into Malibu on Friday afternoon with destructive force, burning dozens of hillside homes in its march to the Pacific Ocean and more than doubling in size from 14,000 acres to 35,000 acres in the span of just a few hours. The fire destroyed houses in Oak Park, Thousand Oaks, Bell Canyon, and other Ventura County communities showed no signs of slowing as evacuation orders and anxiety continued to spread. Kim Kardashian and Elisa Milano were some of the stars forced out as the Woolsey fire evacuations affected nearly 90,000 homes. Daniel Steiner, the principal of Taft High School, had to evacuate his family before he could get the school prepared for evacuees displaced by both Hill and Woolsey fires. There was a fire near the zoo. A fire set in Griffith Park led to the evacuation of some of the Los Angeles Zoo's animals Friday morning. Now, for the week ahead, for those of you in the rest of America, if you're in the eastern United States, be on the alert for severe weather. According to meteorologists, a major storm is due to push through the southeast on Monday, then barrel into New England, where it could become a nor'easter. A major impact could uh, be Tuesday evening with heavy rain possible in major cities and snow inland. The storm was expected to push out by Wednesday afternoon, but another system could hit the same area later in the week. And uh, that brings us to Mr. Garrett Mead. Uh, he was having a conversation with Daniel Orola, our brother in battle, on uh, online on my Facebook timeline. And I did promise to uh, just address what they were uh, bringing up very shortly, as this is, of course, Veterans Day. And they propose such topics before I get into the World War I theme, which is really what Veterans Day was all about originally, Armistice Day, the end of World War I. But uh, Garrett Mead's question brought us to World War II. He did ask why uh, Commander Perry or Commodore Perry of the United States Navy actually had uh, this stupid uh, flag, the illegal flag of the United States manufactured in the first place, or why was he given this stupid flag in the first place of inverted stars of Baphomet, the sigil of uh, Satan himself, 
uh, 31 of them, uh, the inverse of the number 13, and uh, 31 of these stars on a blue field, and uh, of course, the bars, the 13 uh, stripes, uh, red and white. You know, why was this all backward masked on this flag and the other half of it just blank, uh, white like a surrender flag? Who the hell makes a flag like that? What was it doing uh, with Commodore Perry? Uh, in the first place, when the Japanese demanded that it be brought and hung up on the battleship Missouri as a sign of American surrender to the Japanese. Uh, well, the Japanese want to close the circle and have that brought back by a distant relation of Commodore Perry, Douglas MacArthur, to show that they had brought the circle of American aggression to closure. The American aggression was open with Commodore Perry kicking in the door open to Japan for trade. Uh, and he was doing this at a time after America had just gotten its ass kicked in World War Zero. In World War Zero, the Napoleonic conflicts, and I reference it as World War Zero because we'll never get people to be calling it World War One and renaming the world wars. So we might as well give it the zero connotation. It was the world's first truly global war based on mass mobilization of ideology of uh, the population bases of major nation states. Uh, the Napoleonic Wars were one in which the allies were formed by the conventional uh, and conservative crowns of Europe against the radicalized empire of Napoleon Bonaparte and their American allies the Constitutional Republic of the United States, which allied itself with Napoleon Bonaparte, who was radical enough to put the Pope under house arrest, invade Israel, uh, Palestine at the time, uh, capture Jerusalem, and of course, uh, massacre many soldiers of the Ottoman Empire there. After they were unarmed, he had them all uh, massacred. Uh, and uh, this was the kind of man that they were dealing with that the um, Americans had allied with. So the Americans were on the side of the axis of that war. And the Americans lost. Uh, the uh, Canadians, of course, were given orders by the British to invade. And the Canadians, born and bred, not Brits, they didn't have enough ships to deliver a massive expeditionary force to North America at the time at all, being engaged all over the world against France and colonies uh, in even in Indonesia were involved in this conflict and in Asian India. Uh, so with their involvement with their conventional forces worldwide, uh, they sent the Canadians in to burn Washington to the ground, which they succeeded in doing. And after the Americans lost that war, they separated it from their invasion of North Africa because the Americans had, of course, declared war on the Barbary pirates, the Corsairs of Northern Africa, and took up war against Napoleon Bonaparte's enemies, the Ottoman Empire of the Sultans. And when the Americans fought this war, they ran an operationally successful campaign, burning Tripoli to the ground, using deployment of the Marines, uh, brought uh, by America's first high seas naval fleet, uh, to that theater of conflict in the Mediterranean. And uh, once they won uh, that war operationally, they lost it strategically. Uh, when the Canadians counterattacked on behalf of British Empire, then the Americans had to withdraw and lost a conflict which they called the War of 1812, which was actually the Battle of 1812, part of the Napoleonic conflicts of World War Zero. Now, because the Americans had had their asses kicked so thoroughly by the Allies, they didn't want to get involved in another war with England, even though American ships were some of the best in the world and were the only ones really that could go head to head against the British Empire ships. The British Empire had a lot more ships and higher technology and better trained professional sailors overall because they'd been doing this for, you know, another hundred fucking years already and had defeated the Spaniards, the greatest armada in the history of the world at that time. And uh, with that kind of naval experience and indeed superiority, the Americans were not anxious to get into any conflict with the British or a combined European alliance against them ever again. So to evade that fate while trying to force Asia open to American trade so that it could gain an advantage on Europe and the British Empire, the Americans essentially invaded Korea, they invaded Japan. And when they did so, it was at a time when the shogunacy, the uh, samurai generalissimo, the warlord who had ruled the 7,000 islands of Japan for 13 generations, in their senescence, in their weakness at this point in history, 
the Americans attacked and they kicked the doors down and forced the Japanese to open to American trade at great advantage to American traders. And of course, Commodore Perry was what was called a diplomat at arms, meaning that he was not a genuine diplomat of the United States. He was simply a armed terrorist who was a pirate by all definition on the high seas to the Brits and the Europeans, who was going to Japan to unfairly and illegally establish trade before anyone else could get there. Because the Japanese had refused trade with all the European powers, except for the Dutch, and the Dutch had opened a specialized port in Japan, uh, in Nagasaki and in Hiroshima areas, in uh, those areas in particular, in which they even built an artificial island so they wouldn't land foot on the sacred soil of Japan. And the Europeans were civilized about it and they maintained trade through these highly controlled ports with Japan. And that was the only trade there was. So when the Americans full opened the Japanese to open trade all the way, fully open all their doors to American trade, they did so by force of arms and under false pretense. And this false pretense was this goddamn phony fucking American flag that was uh, produced by Commodore Perry. Now, this was issued to him by the United States federal government for several reasons. So if he was captured by the British or any other European power, he would be hung as a terrorist and a rogue pirate with a renegade fleet. Uh, the Americans had plausible deniability because he had a false flag. He was literally operating under a false flag. Because he had this flag that was white on one side and inverted stars on the other, uh, it was not the legal flag of the United States. So it was a flag of piracy. So when he was operating, and if the Brits or the uh, any other Europeans caught him, uh, then they would say, whose flag are you flying under? And he'd produce this piece of shit. He would be hanged. He was an expendable resource. He was doing this he, under plausible deniability. He was given full information. Were he be, would he be caught? Uh, the United States was not going to take the blame. He would be operating entirely on his own. He would not be backed up. There would be no rescue. And uh, were he to succeed in his operations, he would be, of course, given wealth uh, beyond his wildest dreams, a promotion, place in the history books, all of which he ultimately benefited from, none of which he deserved, uh, but what he, he did earn, however, operationally, because he succeeded in his mission. But at the same time, he was a criminal and uh, should have paid the consequences by that uh, definition. At any rate, uh, he wasn't caught during his lifetime, but the Japanese were later on to find out, hey, the flag in which he was flying under, in which they were forced to sign treaties under, was a false flag. In other words, every agreement they signed with the United States for free trade, all advantageous, all at American advantage, was illegal. So this is one of the many, many factors that led to war with the United States. And uh, that's what opened the circle of crisis and conflict. And in order to close that circle of crisis and conflict, Part of the Japanese victory demands in winning World War II against the Americans, in beating the Americans in World War II, was demand that uh, this distant relation, uh, guilty of the sins of the fathers by link of blood, by dint of his heritage, Douglas MacArthur, bring the flag of Commodore Perry, under which the Japanese had been forced to open their gates and sign unfair peace treaties advantageous only to the United States, that this would be brought on the battleship Missouri to be on display when the Japanese held this show ceremony to placate Harry Truman. Because Harry Truman begged on his hands and knees to April Hirohito, you have to let me do something to make the public think that I won the war or they'll vote me out of office and I won't be able to talk peace with you. I won't be able to hold the talk down negotiations that will open American markets to you, the Japanese, to your advantage. And so Hirohito thought this was entirely reasonable, and they allowed a fake ceremony on the battleship Missouri named after the state which Truman was born in. And this flag had to be he's turned over, no samurai swords. Uh, the Americans, of course, had this fake 18-minute ceremony uh, with the Americans, and Truman got to say, oh, we won to the Americans at home, maintain himself in power, not get impeached, and then proceed into talk down ceremonies with the Japanese, which he later on claimed were with extraterrestrial aliens from outer space, along with the man who came after him, Eisenhower. And of course, all of that is an answer to Garrett Mead as to why that stupid flag was there on that battleship the day that uh, the Americans had a big show saying 
that they were holding a surrender ceremony. Now, your United States government does not recognize that as a surrender. Uh, you can look up uh, World War II ending per definition of the U.S. Code, United States Code, which is law as established by Congress, not a federal regulation, law as established by Congress. World War II ended December 31st, 1946, in terms of entering ceasefire. In other words, proactive prosecution of hostilities ended December 31st, 1946. You can look this up. You can verify everything I'm saying. Uh, Title 38, United States Code. And therefore, the own United States government does not recognize the Battleship Missouri show, the circus, as a surrender ceremony, and nor should you. Okay, that answers that. We'll get back to what Veterans Day, originally Armistice Day, was about when we come back next hour. And we will be back. Stay right there. Okay, I am returned. All right, which is something similar to what MacArthur himself once said. And I uh, want to thank everyone for uh, staying here with us. Now, Sunday, 11 11 18. Uh, the world celebrated peace 100 years ago today, so we are told. Uh, what happened was man had created a desert and called it peace. Uh, this is the 100th anniversary of the armistice that ended fighting in the Great War, the war to end all wars, World War One, the next global war the Europeans gave us after World War Zero, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in the year 1918. Now, today, uh, we would look at the insights World War I still offers into great power competition if we had the time to do so, but I'll probably go in depth into the geopolitics of that in our next transmission, uh, at least uh, address those or cover them with a kind of uh, a brief review uh, on uh, Wednesday. But uh, meanwhile, well, let's address what happened uh, today. Uh, Trump uh, canceled a planned visit yesterday to an American cemetery outside of Paris. Uh, this is something every president has done in every administration on every Veterans Day forever, going back to World War I itself or the immediate aftermath thereof. Trump canceled it, of course, uh, with the White House citing the rain, which sometimes grounds the president's Marine Corps One helicopter. But it's all a bunch of bullshit. It was due to the Russia investigation and all the controversy that would be generated that was discouraged by Vladimir Putin. Now, Matthew Whitaker, the acting attorney general now, probably will not recuse himself from the Russia investigation that he's now overseeing. Now, that's a problem for everybody uh, because his past comments in which he expressed deep skepticism about the pro being a Trump cultist and a uh, loyalist of Vladimir Putin by extension, that alone should disqualify him from leading the investigation. Uh, Whitaker's appointment is actually unconstitutional because he has not been confirmed by the Senate. So several senior White House officials have even uh, admitted they're worried the backlash might jeopardize Whitaker's chances of staying in the job. Special Counsel Robert Mueller's team has reportedly started writing its final report on the investigation while President Trump reviews with his attorneys his written answers to Mueller's questions and his fears and protests mount in some political circles that Whitaker might end the probe. Democrats are coming up with a plan to protect Mueller's investigation. What's that have to do with what's going on on the poppy fields of France where so many men died in World War I? Well, you see, the world leaders commemorate the World War I armistice centennial. This is the first hundred years since the end of that incredibly destructive conflict. The war that made the Nazis, the National Socialists, who, of course, were the leaders of the Second World War in resistance against American and Bolshevik empire. Now, uh... Yes. Yeah. So, Brendan, thank you. When Putin saw Trump in France, he gave him a thumbs up. Isn't that a fuck you in Russia? It can be. And that's pretty much his way of showing Trump's his bitch. Let's go there. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, played host in Paris and attend days, including Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, were supposed to get together for a lunch on 
today. But it was Trump and Putin specifically who turned up late and the minute of silence observed at 11.11 was instead observed around 11.20. This was an incredible insult to the dead and buried and an incredible stain on the memory of those who sacrificed. And of course, it was a big fuck you by both Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump, who then met at a short working lunch at the Elysee Palace in Paris on today, November 11th, instead of meeting with other world leaders. It was their big fuck you to everybody. They are two gay lovers who share each other's pantyhose. They're a couple of faggots rolling in the mud together like pigs and shit. But why? Why did they do this? What does this have to do with the Russia investigation? What does all this do with Russia when it's on the Western front of World War I? Because the end of World War I was the commencement of American military engaging in operations in Siberia, a wartime period known in law, the same kind of federal code used to provide benefits for veterans as Russian service, meaning that if you wanted to apply for veterans benefits and you were injured in this operation after World War I, you would be applying for benefits that were due injuries incurred in Russian service. That's when the United States invaded Russia amid the backdrop of increased United States-Russian tensions and even talk of war. Long forgotten to most is the time the United States actually invaded motherfucking Russia. So you have this situation where, of course, uh, the United States uh, is, thanks to already being occupied and administered by Russia via Donald Trump, what was once inconceivable is now conceivable that dangerous tensions between Russia and the United States could lead to military conflict. It's happened before, and I say it must happen again because Russia needs to answer for what it's done to us. Now, another example of this, just how seriously the Russians take it, if you don't believe Putin takes it this seriously, let's go back to September back in 1959. During a brief thaw in the Cold War, Nikita Khrushchev made his famous visit to the United States. In Los Angeles, the Soviet leader was invited to a luncheon at 20th Century Fox Studios in Hollywood, and during a long and rambling exchange, he had this to say. I'm going to quote him now. Your armed intervention in Russia was the most unpleasant thing that ever occurred in the relations between our two countries, for we had never waged war against America until then. Our troops have never set foot on American soil, while your troops have set foot on Soviet soil. Now, those remarks by Khrushchev were little noted in the United States press at the time, especially compared to his widely reported complaint about not being allowed to visit Disneyland. Now, people are going to ask, why wasn't he allowed to be a visitor to Disneyland? Well, there's two reasons for that. One was Walt Disney said, if Nikita Khrushchev visits Disneyland, we won't be able to uh, stand up to our claim of being the happiest place on earth anymore. <laughs> and number two, he hadn't defeated the United States in a war like Emperor Hirohito did. So when Emperor Hirohito had all of his victory conditions delivered to the United States about what he wanted, one of them was, I want a trip to Disneyland. So Emperor Hirohito was given a visit to Disneyland. But Nikita Khrushchev hadn't kicked America's ass in a full-fledged conventional war. He didn't get that privilege. But even if Americans read about Khrushchev's comments, the ones I quoted, not the ones about Disneyland, it's likely few of them would have had any idea what the Soviet premier was fucking talking about. But Soviet, and now Russian memory, is much more persistent. It's obsessive and it's monofocal. The wounds of foreign invasions from Napoleon to the National Socialists were still fresh in Russian public consciousness in 1959 and in Russia today in a way most Americans can never imagine. Among other things, that's why the Russians have reacted with so much outrage to the expansions of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, acronymous as NATO, to its borders in the 1990s, despite American promises not to do so in terms of NATO expansion or to participate in such during the negotiations for the unification of Germany. Nevertheless, it happened. We could go into that some other time. The United States invasion Khrushchev referred to took place a century ago, 100 years ago, after the October Revolution and during the civil war that followed between Bolshevik and anti-Bolshevik forces, the Red Army against the White Russians, their civil war. 
while the Germans and the Austrians were occupying parts of western and southern Russia that they had won in World War I, because in World War I, they won the war on the Eastern Front, unknown to Americans who even teach at American military academies. The Germans won World War I on the Eastern Front. It led to the brest Treaty, and it led to gaining enormous amounts of territory, manpower, and industry, which the Germans and Austrians still occupied after World War I ended in the West. And the Allies then launched their own armed interventions in the Russian North and the Far East, meaning from Asia out of the Pacific, in 1918. The Allied nations included Britain, France, Italy, Japan, and the United States. They cited various justifications for sending their troops to Russia. Primarily, it was all to rescue the Czech Legion of the Czech peoples uh, that had been recruited to fight against the central powers of Germany, Austria, Hungary, to and Turkey, of course, and others, satellite states, to protect allied military stores, keep them out of the hands of the Germans, to preserve communications via the Trans-Siberian Railway, possibly to reopen an Eastern Front of the war. But the real goal, rarely admitted publicly at first, was to reverse the events of the October Revolution and install a more acceptable Russian government. As Winston Churchill later put it, the aim was to strangle the Bolshevik infant in its cradle. The Czech Legion, of all things, was merely bait. Now, in addition to Siberia, the United States joined British and French troops to invade at Archangelsk in the north of Russia in the White Sea on September 4th of 1918. In July of 1918, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson had personally typed the aid memoir on American military action in Russia that was hand-delivered by the Secretary of War at the beginning of August to General William Graves, the designated commander of the United States troops en route to Siberia. Wilson's document was curiously ambivalent and contradictory. It began by asserting the foreign interference in Russia's internal affairs was impermissible and eventually concluded that the dispatch of U.S. troops to Siberia was not to be considered a military intervention. This is what we would call today an undeclared counterinsurgency. As in Korea or Vietnam, it was a police action. This was the non-interventionist intervention. Now, this was far too sophisticated for the general in charge of the operation uh, to even understand. He was an idiot. Uh, a man who was chosen, as I've stated, all generals are chosen in the United States on the basis of appearance. If you look like a sugar cube with mold at the top, meaning if you're white, you have a head that's shaped like a square, and you have a bunch of fuzz at the top that looks like a crew cut, you're made a general, uh, so long as you've been commissioned an officer already. But uh, that's how it's chosen. It has nothing to do with talent. It has nothing to do with intelligence. Generals are chosen because they look, quote-unquote, general-like. I shit you not. That's how it works. This is one of those idiots, and like the overwhelming majority of them, totally incompetent. Nevertheless, the American intervention began when U.S. soldiers disembarked at Vladivostok, known as the ruler of the East in the Russian language. That's the city that is their main gateway to the Orient, to the Pacific. On August 16th of 1918, uh, these were the 27th and 31st Infantry Regiments, regular army units that had been involved in pacification of the United States-occupied Philippines. Combat experienced troops. Eventually, there were to be about 8,000 troops in Siberia. Now, judging from his memoirs, General Graves was borderline, he was an idiot. Uh, he was puzzled at how different things looked on the ground in Siberia than his vague instructions seemed to suggest. For one thing, the Czechs obviously didn't need rescuing. Uh, and uh, by the summer of 2018, uh, excuse me, 1918, 100 years ago, they'd easily taken control of Vladivostok and a thousand miles of Trans-Siberian Railway. Uh, and for the next year and a half... General Graves, uh, who tried to promote this appearance of himself as an honest and non-political professional soldier, he was struggling to understand and carry out his mandate in Siberia. Uh, he seems to have driven the U.S. State Department and his fellow Allied commanders to distraction by clinging stubbornly to a literal interpretation of Wilson's aid memoir as mandating strict non-intervention in Russian affairs. He seemed incapable of noticing the broad 
wink with which everyone else understood these instructions as combating the Soviets. So Graves did indeed strive to maintain neutrality among the various Russian factions battling for control of Siberia and to focus his mission to guard the railroad and protect Allied military supplies. He was also indiscreet enough to report white atrocities, meaning the Tsarist atrocities, as well as red ones, and to express his distaste for the various Japanese-supported warlords in eastern Siberia, and later to have a skeptical and uh, somewhat correct assessment of the low popular support, incompetence, and poor prospects of the anti-Bolshevik forces, as fielded uh, on the side of the Tsars uh, by many uh, immediately drafted conscripts in area mostly from penal battalions or punishment uh, units that had been taken out of what were the gulags of the Tsar. Now, because of his troubles, it was hinted absurdly that the general may have been a Bolshevik sympathizer, uh, and that's a charge that in part motivated the publication of his memoirs. But it was virtual truth, because functionally, that's the role he assumed by maintaining this quote-unquote neutrality. You have to take sides in a situation like that. Now, in the face of hectoring by State Department officials and other Allied commanders to be more active in support of the right people in Russia, Graves repeatedly inquired of his superiors in Washington whether his original instructions of political non-intervention were to be modified. Unfortunately, no one up to President Wilson himself was willing to put any different policy in writing, and therefore the general struggled to maintain his neutrality. Now, by the spring and summer of 1919, however, uh, the United States had joined the other allies in providing overt military support to Supreme Leader Admiral Alexander Kolchak's white czarist regime based in the western Siberian city of Omsk. Now, at first, this was carried out discreetly through the Red Cross. It later took the form of direct shipments of military supplies, including boxcars of rifles whose safe delivery Graves was directed to oversee. And that's what brought American troops into their first direct man-to-man -man combat with the Soviets. Now, all of this was intervention. And the prospects for a victory by Kolchak soon faded, and the whites in Siberia revealed themselves to be a lost cause. Because General Graves was thoroughly incompetent at combat command. So the decision came to remove U.S. troops late in 1919, and General Graves, with the last of his staff, departed from Vladivostok on April Fool's Day, All Fool's Day of 1920, April 1st, because all America had been made fools by this man's criminal incompetence and stupidity and gross negligence as a military commander appointed, as they all are, on the basis of race, height, size, and appearance, as opposed to any qualifications. In all, under his command, 174 American soldiers were killed during the invasion of the Soviet Union in direct combat with Soviet forces. The men held themselves well. They fought as well as they could without reinforcements, without ammunition from General Graves. American soldiers in the field fought the Russians with their bayonets. And they died in the snow, charging to get as close as they could to the communists without being able to fire a shot. Now, interestingly, because of such incidents, pressure to withdraw the United States troops from Siberia came from fed up soldiers and home front opinion opposing the continued deployment of military units abroad long after the conclusion of the war in Europe. Because people in those days couldn't understand the concept of limited war, of undeclared armed hostilities. It's notable that during a congressional debate on the Russian intervention, one senator read excerpts from the letters of American soldiers to support the case for bringing them home. Now, then, as in later U.S. foreign interventions, the soldiers had a low opinion of the people they were supposed to be liberating. One of them wrote home on July 28, 1919, from his base in Verkhny, Udinsk. Now, 
Ulenyud in the southern shore of Lake Baikal, a letter home from a United States soldier during the invasion of Russia that I read from files of this case being read to the United States government, retrieved in documentary form by the U.S. military and stored in their own files at the Presidio Military Base of San Francisco, where I served as a librarian. I quote you now, this one American soldier on the front said, Life in Siberia may sound exciting, but it isn't. It's all right for a few months, but I'm ready to go home now. You want to know how I like the people? Well, I'll tell you, one couldn't hardly call them people. Russians are some kind of fucking animal. They're the most ignorant things I ever saw. Oh, I can get a word of their lingo if they aren't sore when they talk. They sure do rattle off their lingo when they get sore. These so-called people have only one ambition in their entire life, and that's to drink more vodka than the next person in their filthy country. Well, outside of the State Department and some elite opinion, United States intervention has never been very popular. By now, of course, it was widely understood, as one historian later noted, that there may have been many reasons why the Doughboys came to Russia. And the Doughboys were what we called American servicemen in World War I because they all ate dough, uh, the bread that was issued to them. But there was only one reason why they stayed, to intervene in a civil war to see who would govern the country. Now, after 1920, the memory of America's Siberian adventure, as General Graves termed it, soon faded into obscurity. The American public, of course, is notorious for its historic amnesia, even as similar military adventures were repeated again and again over the years since then. Now, it seems that we might need to be reminded every generation or so of the perils of foreign military intervention. And, of course, one of the things that people could do is go back to the statements of General Graves to try and advocate against it. And General Graves, of course, stated, there isn't a nation on earth that would not resent foreigners sending troops into their country for the purpose of putting this or that faction in charge. The result is not only an injury to the prestige of the foreigner intervening, but is a great handicap to the faction the foreigner is trying to assist. He said all this because he was advocating for the communists. He was writing about Siberia in 1918, but it could just as well have been Vietnam in the 1960s or Afghanistan and Syria today, or about 30,000 NATO troops on Russia's borders. And that's what Vladimir Putin wants to get rid of, along with, of course, vengeance for the American invasion of Russia against his communist people who trained him as a KGB agent back when a Russian, a Ukrainian, an Azeri or any nationality in that empire would never dare to say their nationality. If some foreigner were to come up to them and ask, what are you? They wouldn't dare say, I'm a Lithuanian. They wouldn't dare say I'm Belarus. They'd say, I'm Soviet, which simply means I'm part of the great collective. That's the world Vladimir Putin would like to reunite and beyond. That's why they fucked everybody with the big fuck you at the World War I centennial on behalf of motherfucking Russia so that Putin and Trump could get together alone to talk about remediating what's going on with NATO, which is why Trump wants to pull out of it and why, of course, America is doing everything it's doing concerning the Russian investigation into the cause of all this grief you're suffering today. But we still have a case of rhyme being greater than repeat when it comes to history. That's why the centenary of World War I offers lessons for the United States-China relationship. You see, the entire Sino-Slavic synaxis, the Russia-China alliance, is an illusion. Everybody knows its faults. It's total pretense. The Russians and the Chinese hate each other. And Russia's trying to fuck the Chinese via trade war declared against them and their economic growth by Russian puppet Donald Trump. That brings us back to World War I. 
United States-China security talks today, tensions are running high ahead of the security dialogue in Washington, with China having already voiced displeasure at the United States' support of my own true homeland and heartland of Taiwan, which, of course, resulted in the bust of much industrial espionage on the part of the communist Chinese using Taiwan intelligence and police investigative assistance, rewritten propagandistically in your newspapers as some kind of busting of Taiwan companies, all of which I proved to be completely false in one of my recent transmissions. Go through my last two or three transmissions, I go into it in great detail. An awkward moment for the United States and its relations with China, if ever there was one. Now the Chinese Communist Party sees the relevance of looking at World War I as a case study outlining how economically interdependent countries can devolve into conflict. And it's far from alone. The case for Asia would be a prognosis of ominous foreboding. You can get to that on Wednesday. We're going to turn back to the domestic issues now, because that's the crisis that's affecting us in this civil war that's got the Republican insurgents sponsored by motherfucking Russia in vengeance for the invasion of their own nation from back in World War I. Now the shelter that took in California's shooting victims had to take in, still is taking in now, wildfire evacuees. The California shelter where mourners huddled after the massacre at the borderline bar and grill it's now a refuge for residents fleeing the state's massive wildfire. Uh, there's an evacuee, Cynthia Ball, uh, who was in that makeshift structure after she fled from raging flames that forced her from her home in Thousand Oaks. She said it was like we're all walking around in a trance. It's like welcome to hell. Uh, one day earlier, uh, we had uh, grief-stricken friends and family in that area gathering after that crazed fucking Marine, Ian David Long, opened fire at a crowd in the nearby borderline on Thursday, killing a dozen people. Uh, there was one survivor who knew Ian David Long in high school, and he told the Washington Post that the Afghanistan war vet drunkenly punched a fellow Marine and broke his nose at a New Year's party in 2011, saying he was just pissed off and drunk, was trying to get into a fight. This was according to a witness named Todd Stratton. Uh, no one knew why he was getting so upset. Uh, I'm going to go a bit more into this man's mental history inescapably uh, because of all the questions that have been relayed to me about his being a mind control uh, asset. But it was most certainly a hellish 24 hours for all the Thousand Oaks residents and particularly for one Melissa Snyder. Now, I actually looked into this young lady's backstory. She had a close family friend, Noel Sparks, who was 21 years old who got killed in the shooting Wednesday night at the borderline bar and grill. She'd known Sparks since he was a baby, could barely make sense of the tragedy, which unfolded minutes from her home in the Hillcrest neighborhood. Then Friday morning, Snyder stood in a robe in a Woodland Hills parking lot outside of a Manhattan bagel shop surrounded by her husband and five of her kids because they had to leave their home in the middle of the night as the Woolsey fire crept closer and a mandatory order came in. Her daughter Kaylee got a frantic call from her friend Madison that they needed to get moving. It was that kind of day at Thousand Oaks, just hours after the community was staggered by the news of the shooting at that popular bar that kills a dozen and gets faced with a destructive wildfire that forces massive evacuations. Uh, and at a memorial for the victims Thursday afternoon, smoke from the fire was already visible, as I said. And uh, you had all these people there at this vigil embracing, crying softly, and then their cell phones going off in Unision. And then they all sighed. And you get this warning of this ominous orange smoke rising in the sky. And uh, all of this I was able to review thanks to my friend accessing his computer for me. Uh, and when I got into that, I was able to catch up on a lot of what I had missed out on Friday over the weekend. Still, of course, have to be able to get to YouTube uh, to do what I need to do uh, in acknowledging the people who sent those kind uh, entries. Uh, with the help of my Maki benefactress and Rose Dio. I'm sure that'll be done soon. Now, um, of course, all these people wound up evacuated. Now, you have areas that were placed under mandatory evacuation that included the entire communities of Oak Park and Westlake uh, Village, portions of Thousand Oaks. Uh, you know, I could go into the detail. 
because I did check out the neighborhood and uh, in terms of uh, looking at the reports that were coming in about it. And uh, it, it was just piling up. Uh, basically, uh, the drive south on the 101, which ultimately got closed down, was like you were leaving hell. Uh, it was crowded for 3 a.m. At least it was still moving. And, of course, you could smell the smoke uh, during the service at the uh, vigil at Cavalry Church. And, of course, everyone was left just confused and overwhelmed. Uh, basically, uh, they didn't even get over the one tragedy until the next one started. Um, this is all psychological operations meant to compound the shock effect uh, in such a way that people never recover. This is how you get people to surrender in war, one shock after another. The Soviets have a term for it. In the battlefield, they call it a multi-echelon attack. This is, of course, something that was studied by Mike Lucchino. This is the operational program they're following in Thousand Oaks. So the scene at the Thousand Oaks Teen Center reflected all the painful experiences that residents had been enduring under this multi-echelon attack. And that's where the family and friends of those missing from the borderline shooting came over to await word about their fates. Many were left with the worst news of their lives, that their loved ones had died. And now that sprawling center is being used as a shelter for evacuees from the fire. These people don't even know if they're going to have a house to return to. Uh, I read Rumble Port from Judy Goodman, uh, 70 years of age, said she heard a loud crash in her living room around 1 a.m. Friday, found shattered pieces of glass all over her home, was stunned to discover a tree had crashed through their, her roof because the winds generated by the fires, the fires have been so strong as to generate what I've described scientifically before as flaminados, fire tornadoes. The winds were that strong, lifting trees up by their roots, throwing them through people's ceilings, smashing them down like giant hammers. Now, a few minutes later, Judy Goodman heard a pounding on her door. It was police officers telling her to leave. The fire was dangerously close to her home. All she could grab was some socks, her dog, and a few pictures and put them in the car or drive to that teen center where everybody else was waiting. One thing after another. She was crying all day yesterday or the day before because of the shooting. And then this happened. And uh, she's thankful she found a safe place to rest. But she was distraught when she learned it was where people had found out the day before their loved ones had died. Literally, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable because statistically, it's impossible. This is an intentional psyop an intentional attack. So let's take a look at the attack itself now, inescapably. Thousands Oak shooting, it left 13 people dead, if you include the gunman as a human being, left 18 people injured. The gunman was identified as 28-year-old veteran and Marine Corps uh, veteran at that, David Ian Long. Uh, note, individuals who've served in the United States military are at least twice as likely to commit mass shootings as the rest of the adult population. That's statistic number one. You take that and you make certain any military man who tries to muscle in on your territory, punch your nose in some kind of fight or something, you make sure you take him down so you don't become the mass, mass shooting victim. The only thing they respect is force. Now, the autopsies found the California bar shooter killed himself. Uh, nevertheless, the Tura County Sheriff's Sergeant Ron Hellis, surname spelled H-E-L-U-S, was among the first law enforcement officers to arrive at the bar shortly after 11.20 p.m. He gave his life as a human meat shield. He'll be remembered as a hero. Then you've got the forever aftermath of mass shootings. Now, Americans affected by gun violence talk about trauma, grieving, intermittent hope. Now, this Saturday, hundreds of thousands of Americans rallied in Washington, D.C., maybe around the country to protest gun violence and mass shootings. Uh, because of incidents like this, mass shootings are deep in the country's connective tissue. They leave wimps, aches, sleepless nights. They inflict post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a combat experience for civilians. They're the cause of too many funerals. 
They fling some people across political divides and further entrench others in positions they held before. Many survivors and relatives of victims become advocates for gun control measures, others for open carry laws. Some work to eradicate firearms from the communities. Others buy more firearms to feel safe at home. Some morph into activists and politicians, processing their grief or trauma through social action. Others continue to live their lives in private. They become hermits, shutting themselves off from the world in their pain. Those whose families are splintered by mass shootings in America sometimes weave new connections with their peers, a substitute family of sorts, built from steadily compounding national tragedies. Now, on the occasion of uh, the march that was uh, supposed to be taking place this Saturday, or was supposed to happen in direct response to this, I was looking into the background of some of the people who were advocating for it. They were all survivors, and they had family members or themselves affected by previous shootings at schools, places of worship, nightclubs, like the one that my surrogate son almost attended the time it was shot up by a homophobic gunman in Florida. Now, all of this brings to myself a better understanding of how trauma changes the direction of a life, how people view the apparent shift in the national conversation around gun violence, especially that which uh, followed the shooting that killed 17 people in Parkland, Florida, in February, and in a kind of... Uh, chronological order of when the shootings occurred, the ones that stick out for me were the stories of, say, for instance, Deborah Heitner, who lived through the shooting at Massachusetts's Bard College at Simons Rock in 1992, back when mass shootings were still a foreign concept. There was a Heather Martin, who was a senior at Columbine High School during the infamous 1999 shooting that left 15 dead. The very same costume, a black trench coat, which was worn by this Marine Corps asshole. And then there was a Lisa Hamp who lived through the mass shooting at Virginia Tech in 2007, which left 33 dead. And that was an exceptional mass shooting in the negative sense, in that it was one of the only mass shootings in which it wasn't a white trash piece of shit, but a Chinese individual who apparently was some MK Ultra victim. And then there was, of course, a former police officer and teacher, uh, Pardeep Singh Kaleka, lost his father in the 2012 Sikh temple shooting in Wisconsin. And in the years since, he's been working as a trauma therapist. And then, of course, there was the Scarlett Lewis, uh, lost her six-year-old son, who died in the 2012 shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary. And she's dedicated herself to helping young people better manage their emotions, form meaningful relationships, uh, Elisa Parker's daughter, Emily, died in the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, and she went on to co-found a school safety organization. And then there's Sarah Clements, a senior at Georgetown University, who recalled how her mother's experience as a teacher who survived the Sandy Hook shooting helped to spur them both to the cause of gun violence prevention. And then there was a uh, Melvin Graham, who lost his sister, Cynthia Graham Hurd, in the Emmanuel AME church shooting in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015. Uh, another story I read about was a Christine Leonon, whose son Christopher was one of the 49 people killed at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando in 2016, where, of course, my own surrogate son was in area, actually headed there, and it was just the most incredible series of coincidences that led him uh, to not enter the club or actually go in area within blocks, he turned around, was distracted by something else, and that's when the shooting went down. But one of the people who died there, of course, one of the half a hundred of them, was uh, this individual named Christopher Leonon, and uh, his mother, uh, she lost him, and her son's best friend, Brandon Wolf. Uh, and uh, basically, they went on, uh, the survivors, to uh, turn to activism as a way of honoring him, those that were lost. Now, these are like just a small sample of countless Americans whose lives have been forever altered by gun violence. And uh, the reason I bring that up is because I'm going to bring to your attention maybe something you could do to help the people at Thousand Oaks. But 
in the meantime, there's something that I really dreaded doing, but I have to turn to. And that's basically the technology of the firearm that was deployed. Authorities have since confirmed that the gun that was used by this Marine Corps asshole had an extended magazine for ammunition. And California lawmakers and voters in particular have sought to ban these magazines. Now, one of the posts I had published on my own Facebook timelines in the past was the Sandy Hook Promise post by Nicole Hotley. Her surname spelled H-O-C-K-L-E-Y, like hockey, but it's pronounced Hockley. That's the mother of Dylan Hockley. And um, he was someone who was like uh, six years old or something like that when he got killed by the Sandy Hook shooter. And uh, I'll read this short paragraph first before I go into the terrorism she suffered thereafter. Because this is what happens to all these people thanks to the Republican insurgency as funded by the Russians. This war is a psychological war. It's not guided by a general. It's guided by a former KGB agent, Vladimir Putin. He's operating not on destroying your bodies. He's operating on destroying your mind, your spirit, your very soul. He's got to take you apart cell by cell. This woman, Nicole Hockley, is a case study in how he's doing it. Now, her Sandy Hook promise essentially said this. In three short paragraphs, the shooter who killed my beautiful butterfly dial-in carried 10 30-round large-capacity gun magazines, ammunition carriers into Sandy Hook Elementary, 300 rounds. He deliberately left the smaller capacity magazines at home. In approximately four minutes, he shot 154 bullets, killing 20 children and six educators. Five of those bullets hit Dylan, and in an instant, my little boy was gone. But in the time it took the shooter to reload, 11 children were able to escape. If magazines were limited to one-third the number of rounds available that day, just think how many more children could have survived. Perhaps Dylan would still be alive today. Perhaps more people would have escaped from the horrific mass shootings in Las Vegas and Texas. That's why I'm trying to gather 50,000 petition signatures demanding Congress limit the size of gun magazines. But we're still several thousand short, and it looks like you haven't signed yet. So please sign the petition right now to help save lives. Now, I've shared that on both my Facebook timeline. Of course, I've signed. And this is what brings me to the next stage of her life. Her doing this is a way of channeling her grief, and she's punished for it. You see, what she's also writ, I'm going to read to you now, and I'm going to choke back my rage. She says this, my child was murdered at Sandy Hook. Alex Jones keeps my pain alive. Megan Kelly is a mom just like me. Like me, she tries to benefit the world with her work journalism in her case, protecting other families from preventable gun violence in mine. I take my work very seriously as she does, she, herself. The difference between us is that I work to honor my son, Dylan, who was murdered at Sandy Hook Elementary School in 2012. Now, she's talking about Megan Kelly, who wound up interviewing Alex Jones, providing him a voice, a platform to continue to spew his lies about her son's death. So she goes on to say about Megyn Kelly, I respect Kelly's journalism, which she should never have said, but we can go on with my criticism later. But it's important that her work be done responsibly. On this count, she's falling short of the mark of responsibility. Kelly has had a job to do, and I appreciate that, especially if it serves to expose and possibly demote someone who's been given credibility for doing nothing but spreading lies and hate. Still, it wasn't a hard choice for me to ask her to step down as host of the Sandy Hook Promise Champions Gala this week. Her decision to interview Alex Jones, a self-professed performer who has used his position of host at the website Infowars.com to transmit conspiracies about the shooting at Sandy Hook and other tragedies, is unacceptable. Jones may view his actions as harmless entertainment, but he does not acknowledge the impact his lies have on real people, online and in person. Harassment and threats of physical harm and death are not entertainment. They are real and they are terrifying, and they happen to me every day because of Alex Jones. 
Imagine yourself in my shoes for just one moment. Imagine your child, one of your children, was brutally murdered, and then someone like Alex Jones spreads lies about yourself and your child and provokes others to continue those lies, harass, and threaten you with rape, death, the burning down of your home. Put yourself in the shoes of any parent from any tragedy that Jones claims was a quote-unquote false flag. Imagine someone telling you that you're an agent in a government conspiracy, not a grieving parent who's lost a child. Would you accept this being done to you? Would you want to receive the same emails and tweets we do? Would you want to go to your mailbox and open letters full of hateful words or violent images showing photographs of your own home with box of burnt masters sent with them? Would you want to receive death threats and bombs in the mail simply because you suffered a measurable loss and are trying to help others? Again, to continue with what she says, I first heard from conspiracy theorists in January 2013, just one month after the shooting at Sandy Hook School that took the life of my beautiful son, alongside 19 other first graders and six educators. To think that anyone could possibly believe the shooting was staged for the purpose of gun control or some other government agenda, or that my son had not died or had never lived, and that I was just a crisis actor. Both shocked and infuriated me. To then read what those hoaxers were saying about me and my family was simply unbelievable. In the beginning, I tried to have conversations with them, identifying myself, explaining what happened and responding to their ridiculous hypothesis. That was a big mistake. The more I engaged them, the bolder they grew with their attacks and their vicious hate spread to new gullible minds who then joined in the attack. It didn't take me long to learn an important rule. Don't feed the trolls. Don't read the comments. Don't respond to emails and block all hoaxers who reach out on social media. Overall, do not engage. Not everyone shares my opinion. I respect that each person or family targeted by hoaxers has their own choices to make. But for me and Sandy Hook Promise, the gun violence prevention organization I helped launch, our position has remained steadfast on this issue. We do not support anyone who gives a platform and voice to hoaxers. We do not feed the trolls because we know the, the consequences of those actions are felt by families like us. I understand that Megyn Kelly and NBC are trying to expose Jones for his wrongdoings and to question how a person such as this has been elevated to such a position of assumed credibility. By the way, she was totally wrong. I have to break in here. All they were doing was promoting Alex Jones and promoting Vladimir Putin and promoting his Sandy Hook hoax. To go back to what she says, but there's a bigger picture here. It's not just the nearly unbearable pain of having to deal with the harassment on top of having lost a child. It's that giving Jones the credibility of an NBC interview special legitimizes him. He will get more fame, publicity, and wealth, and worse, he may encourage more people to seek the attention they get when they support his theories through hateful acts that make it impossible for us to live in peace without fear. Fear of Marines, like David Ian Jones. Now, to go back to her and what she says, Alex Jones has a right to freedom of speech, but that doesn't mean anyone has to give him a louder voice, more views, and more publicity. Though the public may become more educated about conspiracy theorists, they will not understand the damage people like Jones inflict on the real subject of the interview, the families like mine who have become targets. This is why I've called upon Megyn Kelly and NBC News not to broadcast this interview on Sunday. This was last year she wrote this. Publicity, notoriety, and fame are Jones's lifeblood. Take these away, ignore the hoaxers, and the Joneses of the world fade into obscurity. My request is that NBC and Megyn Kelly do the right thing. The thing I had to learn to do when I was still grieving for my six-year-old son, don't feed the trolls. Think of the people that will feel the consequences and harm from your action. Don't give Jones a platform to spew hate and lies. But of course, they did, and she wound up with more incredibly detailed threats, like photographs taken of her where she thought she was alone in public, that drew in genitalia and the knives or firearms that they would insert into her vagina or anus when they blew her brains out after unloading a full high-capacity magazine. That's the kind of threat she got in that detail every day. That's what I get every day. And all because, in her case, she lost a six-year-old child. This is why when people ask me, how could I be so hard on the former black Muslim, now an apostate, Abdul Karim Haq, when he attacked me concerning the shootings at Sandy Hook and the shootings that took place in Florida. 
that he said were all false flags, that these are all crisis actors. He proved what he's all about when, after he had sold me on the idea he was going to provide his children tutoring, home education as he called it. I thought this was an extension of what they were getting at school, where his own daughter is on the honors roll at Hamtronic Muslim Elementary School. And his own daughter on the honors roll, receiving all of this attention because of how gifted she was, he pulled her and his son out of Hamtramck Muslim School for two reasons. He's no longer a Muslim. It wasn't going to be just tutoring. He's going to try and homeschool them himself. He never purchased any tutors, never hired anybody. And he saved $600 a month in gas and automobile insurance because he could give up his car and, know how, and not have to drive them to school anymore. And as a parasite, he still kept asking people for money when people should be reporting him for child abuse. This is the kind of man he was. That's the kind of man that buys into this kind of conspiracy. The kind of man who would take his own gifted daughter out of a school and then supposedly raise her at home so he can get up anytime he wants to smoke pot to wake and bake, as he calls it. Doesn't have to get up early to go to school anymore. Doesn't have to pay for the car insurance. Doesn't have to buy gas. That's the kind of man who buys into this shit. The kind of man who would sacrifice the future of his children so he could stay home and smoke dope. This is the kind of man that needs to be reported and his children taken away. That's the kind of man that buys into this conspiracy theory. Every one of you out there, if you buy into this kind of conspiracy theory, you're a piece of shit. And now for the male white trash piece of shit behind the gun. We've talked about the gun, the high capacity magazines. After the shooting, a picture has emerged of the gunman as a troubled veteran of the Marines who was already known to authorities. A high school track coach of the Thousand Oaks gunman told the Times in California he was assaulting her 10 years ago. He's a sexual assailant, a rapist, and uh, he assaulted her in 2008. Her name is Dominique Collel. Her name spelled C-O-L-E-L-L. -L. She was the high school track and field coach to Thousand Oaks shooter Ian David Long. Uh, and she does confirm she was that Long sexually assaulted her while in high school. And, of course, he's the guy who opened fire at the Borderline Bar and Grill at Thousand Oaks on Wednesday night. And, of course, Colel was watching the news of the shooting when she heard the name of the shooter and her jaw just dropped. She recognized Long's name as her one-time attacker. The event took place during a track practice 10 years ago while Colel was trying to determine who a found cell phone belonged to. She said Ian came up and started screaming at her that it was his phone. He just started grabbing her. Grabbed her by the pussy, just like Trump says to. Groped her stomach, groped her butt. Proceeded to throw her down, get on top of her. And she pushed him off her and said, after that, you're off the team. She reported the incident to another coach and to a school administrator. Who told her she was just too young and good looking to be taken seriously. So she was pressured to accept Long's apology and let him back on the team so as not to jeopardize Long's future in the Marine Corps. Isn't that so fucking special? Now, she's made a point of publicly stating that while she notes some have contended that Long's act of violence could be a result of PTSD after serving in Afghanistan, she believes he had anger issues and emotional problems long prior. Well, the one thing I would admonish of her is not to give this guy any kind of defense by providing him some kind of excuse by saying he's got some kind of issues. Because that's almost like a cover. But more importantly, by her saying that, she provides a confirmation and an indisputable fact about what I've always emphasized. When you take away the draft, then you've got all these people volunteering to serve in the military because they're unemployable anywhere else and would otherwise be in jail. The overwhelming people, amount of people, the type of people who go into the military are the kind of people who fit the profile of the unemployable, sociopath, psychotic, antisocial loser. People like this son of a bitch, David Ian Long. So, 
all of this confirms what I've said about when you meet somebody in the military, they're fucked up from the get-go. The military didn't fuck them up. They're criminals in the first place, or they wouldn't have joined. Are there good men in the military? Yes. And they die quick, or they serve unhappily, like an innocent man, unjustly sentenced to prison. Now, my father was a good man. He served in the military all his life. This was the old school military, true. So there's a qualifier there. But at the same time, he didn't know how to escape. Once he was in, he couldn't adapt to any other environment. He was very passive. That's why he became an alcoholic. It was I who had to advocate for his benefits later in life when he should have been assigned them as soon as he was discharged, which was honorable after serving well over 30 years in the U.S. Navy. Now, in terms of the modern individual, I have my own reasons. I joined the military was just for the resume because I was going to go into security and mercenary work, which I did. In terms of other men like this, they're entering because they're unfit for social acclimation. Now, mental health experts have declined to commit long after a separate April disturbance. A mental health expert declined to commit. The gunmen, police were called into David Ian Long's home in April for reports of a disturbance and a crisis team felt he might be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, but they ultimately cleared him. This is Veterans Administration for you. VA intervention from the White House. President Trump described David Ian Long as in the Thousand Oaks Massacre as quote unquote, a very sick guy suggested without evidence, not only that he had post-traumatic stress disorder, but also that combat veterans generally return with mental health issues, which I think says something right there. So that brings us to all these U.S. mass shootings, gun issues, mental health issues, war issues. It's always the day after a high profile mass shooting in America. That's the only time Republicans will ever pretend to care about the mentally ill. So you've got uh, this Marine Corps faggot who, like a disproportionately high number of mass shooters in the United States, served in the military, reportedly suffered from PTSD as a result of his experiences in Afghanistan. And, of course, America's war in Afghanistan is technically, it hasn't ended, so technically, it's the longest war in American history. Actually, of course, World War II is the longest, and we haven't gotten to that point where we've beaten out World War II just yet, which was 15 fucking years. But if you take a look at it, we're heading up there. So you have all kinds of people who suddenly make excuses for them. Say the shooter was deployed in Afghanistan during the period when the United States sustained the most casualties of the entire war, 2010 to 2011, that the Marine Corps released his service record. Uh, and of course, his date of service was August 4th, 2008 through March 2nd, 2013. He was a machine gunner. And, uh, of course, deployed to Afghanistan 2010, late in the year, November 16th through June 14th of 2011. We all already know the script by heart now. Uh, Long demand for gun control legislation will come from Democrats and progressives. Well, conservatives will insist that America's mass shooting epidemic is a mental health issue, not a gun issue. The debate will rage on impotently for a few days to a few weeks, and exactly zero changes will be made in United States gun policy or in mental health care. It happens every single time. Now, there's, that's really the only debate Americans are allowed to have about these shootings. It's already seeing arguments cranked up by both sides, marching everyone into their respective partisan stables. And the spectrum of acceptable debate has been narrowed down to two opposing viewpoints, which cancel each other out, neither of which will ever come anywhere remotely close to inconveniencing anyone who has real power. And we'll get back to that when we get back. Do stay right there. Okay. Uh, Paul adds in another fact that I myself was unaware of, that the shooter, uh, depressingly, there was a girl at Borderline who had gotten rid of him. Now, there's other factors as to why he attacked Borderline. It wasn't just because of that girl who was there. You don't want to give these mass shooters the excuse because that blames it on the woman. And one of the things that Republicans do is they say, 
oh, some woman spurned him. And that's why the mass shooter went and did what he did. What they're really saying is if you cunts just spread your fucking legs and allowed any penis to penetrate, we wouldn't have all these mass shootings. So that's kind of information people actually don't even need to hear. It actually detracts, unfortunately, from the reality of the situation that these people are inherently evil. Now, a lot of this has to do with uh, what I'm going to go into now, of course, but I appreciate uh, Paul bringing that up. I believe that someone told me, whether it was Paul or somebody else, somebody just sent me a a bit of email saying, uh, and Paul says, thanks for qualifying it. Yes, no excuse. Thank you. Uh, and uh, somebody also sent me uh, a message. It was either in a different text box from the general or, or something, probably from Paul, uh, who I spoke to on Friday about it, saying that uh, my, um, it, it, of course, my password for YouTube would be the same as for my Gmail. Uh, it actually doesn't make a difference. The YouTube, since I was shut out of the YouTube originally, says that the only way I can respond to the people whose messages were brought to my attention uh, by Rose Dio, the only way I could click a like to uh, respond to them would be uh, for to open a new channel. Apparently, whatever channel I was connected with or somehow clicking through before, uh, when Rose would bring such things to my attention, I would acknowledge people that's been like somehow, I don't know, disbanded or something. So uh, so I'll let uh, the monkey benefactors handle that. Some adult handle that, you know, who has the password to what I've got and they can go in there and take care of that. Uh, either set up a new channel or, or something, which I don't need. I don't need a new channel. So hopefully they can avoid setting up a new channel. <laughs> so there you go. There, there's things that just, you know, are, are, I, I'm, I'm not a competent adult uh, in so many ways. Uh, and of course, uh, the uh, that of course doesn't mean that I can't do what I do, uh, such as operate in the field at a level of leadership which I have in the past. Uh, it's when it comes to things like this, it's just better for me to delegate authority. Um, anyhow, uh, when we've spoken of these kinds of arguments uh, on both sides of the fence after these kinds of incidents, you should always be skeptical when you see a popular line of debate as what I've described. Now, Noam Chomsky, the linguist, of course, someone who uh, leans very far to the left. Uh, uh, Not that uh, I myself do. I'm a radical centrist, which is exactly the position taken by Napoleon Bonaparte uh, after the French Revolution. Uh, One of the aspects of Bonapartism was radical centrism. I myself of, of the radical centrist bent, meaning that, of course, I'm radicalized towards action but in a very conservative fashion, as opposed to the radicalization to the right, which has been taken by the Republican Party under Russian influence. But Noam Chomsky, of course, always leaned to the left. And uh, one of the things that he stated was the smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow very lively debate within that spectrum, even encourage the more critical and dissident views that gives people the sense that there's free thinking going on, while all the time the presuppositions of the system are being reinforced by the limits put on the range of the debate. Now, that, of course, is stated by Noam Chomsky, who very much was a just decided to be a communist. Uh, But uh, he himself uh, was all the more honest in his social criticism of the United States because he had a viewpoint that at least was ideologically rooted in a coherent ideology. Uh, And with that, he did not revise or rewrite history the way the alternative right literally takes pride in when they call themselves Holocaust deniers or, quote unquote, historical revisionists, which is what the right has taken to doing. The right totally creates psychotic fantasy as opposed to simply basic constructive criticism on historical fact. So in that sense, the radical right in the United States and consequently the West has gone far off the deep end, just off the edge of the cliff. So the reason that's so dangerous administration like Trump's as manipulated by the psyops of KGB agent Putin and his Russia are that the propagandists are manipulating your society, constantly narrowing that spectrum of debate as to the point where it's just empty bickering, which poses no real threat to real power. They want you arguing about whether or not the Democrats are better than the Republicans on totally different basis than the stance that I take. Not whether the 
two-party system is rigged for the elite class that owns it, get with me in out-of-date perspective now. It's anachronistic. We don't have time for that. We have to work with what we have. We know the Republican Party is under foreign influence. This renders them a hostile insurgency. As a result, you have to take the side of the Democrats if you're an American. There's no other argument there. That's not narrowing the debate. On my end, that's dealing with the hard facts of history. You don't fight history. You don't revise it. You don't create psychotic fantasy. You use history. That's the historical ground which we have to stand. So in the interim, Putin wants you to argue about Trump's rude tweets, the hurt feelings of Jim Acosta, not the administration's persistent advancement of longstanding world-threatening reactionary military agendas. They want you to argue about whose speech should be censored on the Internet, not whether there should be Internet censorship at all, for instance. I've argued there must be because of what's done with the ability of these people to express themselves on the Internet. I've explained before, we've got to repeal the First Amendment. They don't have any fucking First Amendment anywhere in Europe or anywhere else in the world. No place in communist China. In all those places, communist China being a good example. You get on the Internet, you can say anything you want, except what people know you can't say. And it's generally understood you can say anything you want except I love Taiwan or free to be or I'm Falun Gong. Other than that, you're allowed to say anything you want. It's the same way in Canada. There's no First Amendment in Canada. There's no First Amendment in Australia. There's no First Amendment anywhere. And everybody is able to speak their piece other than what's generally understood as what you can't. We have to get to that level of social evolution. That's why, in order to prevent it, Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump are exploiting mass media with their alliances in the alternative right, the so-called alternative media, all at this point homogenous and unified under Michael Aquino. That's your opaque government agencies manipulating your public thought to their advantage. They don't actually care if civilians are shooting each other as long as it doesn't damage their investment in their monopoly of media over you, which is the alternative media, which is taking people to the point where they deny reality itself. People like that, of course, don't care how many bullets you're allowed to put into your gun. They don't care if the mentally ill receive etiquette treatment. They care very much about their ability to manufacture consent for these endless military campaigns that they're waging for profit and geopolitical dominance. Now that's why Michael Aquino's co-religionist General Paul Vallely established ISIS, the same man who co-authored the book Mind War with him. He's the man who admitted openly that he established ISIS. And they did that specifically so Vladimir Putin would have an opening and a reason to invade Syria and establish military dominance in the region. They're operating with a foreign dictator to create more individuals like this David Ian Long. It's already well documented that individuals who served in the military are at least twice as likely to commit mass shootings as the rest of the adult population. This should surprise no one. Being exposed to meaningless acts of slaughter can break your mind, which is why there is a suicide epidemic among U.S. veterans. Couple that factor with PTSD and the way servicemen are psychologically conditioned and desensitized to the killing of human beings. And you've got a perfect program for mass murder when those men come home. Now, of course, not all mass shootings are committed by veterans, even though U.S. military veterans are twice as likely to commit mass shootings. Two thirds of mass shootings are committed by people who never served in the military. But those shootings, in a very real sense, are related to U.S. more warmongering as well. The kind of warmongering provided by Donald Trump when he says that we're at war with the media and the media is your enemy. When he says we're at war with colored people, especially immigrants, and they're all your enemy. We're at war with Muslims 
and they're all your enemy. So when you take a look at the three most overlooked, underappreciated aspects of the human experience, consciousness itself, the extent to which compulsive thinking habits dominate our lives, the extent to which we're influenced by domestic propaganda, American society is saturated in war propaganda. It has been for a long time, to the extent that hardly anyone even notices anymore. And like a fish that's in the sea, it doesn't know anything about water, doesn't have any conscious awareness of it until it's pulled out. Now, in the United States, it's things like ubiquitous flag worship, uh, intelligence and defense agencies influencing Hollywood movie scripts, the way the mass media consistently rallies in support for every new military campaign while ignoring the endless ongoing nature of the old ones. These things are all so pervasively normalized, they don't even stand out in the background much. But they're very abnormal, and they have real consequences. Now, if we lived in a healthy world where war suddenly erupted, every single person would recoil with shock. But because it's something we're born into and indoctrinated into accepting as the norm, it gets taken as a natural part of life. And because Americans happen to live where the Western Empire concentrates most of its military might, they're the most pervasively propagandized people on Earth. So now it just slides right into their minds unchecked when something happens, like the alternative media under Russian command says the white hats in Syria, the white helmets, are really taking children and selling them into child slavery when they're actually rescuing kids out of bomb buildings which the Russians have assaulted artillery. That's when, of course, you've got war criminals, whether it's George W. Bush or Donald Trump, humanized and embraced by their ostensible opposition, the way dangerous new Cold War escalations are being continually advanced against the United States by Russia, while the mass media tells reactionaries that, of course, it's all the liberal progressive Democrats' fault that they're Russophobic to the point of hysteria. That's just to name a few very recent examples. If war propaganda didn't significantly impact the public psyche, no one would use it. The correlation between mass murder in the United States and domestic war propaganda, for that reason, has never been scientifically researched. Because the suggestion that domestic war propaganda exists in the United States has never gained any academic acceptance. Anyone who's paid attention to Western media's unforgivable facilitation of the invasion of Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom knows that corporate news media is a reliable partner to the United States military, may as well be part of the military itself. But the first order of propagandizing an ostensibly free country with a First Amendment is to hide the fact that that country is being propagandized. If it entered into mainstream awareness that the powerful people who control mass media are using it to manipulate the way Americans think, perceive, behave, and vote, trust in those outlets would fall away and the ability to inform the masses would be lost. But that's why the masses can't be informed anymore. You see, under Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump, Donald Trump has taken away a guilty party, the fourth estate, and turned it into the domestic enemy, an enemy of the state. Because it's these people who would expose to you that the Russians have fucking landed. That it's the American intervention and the Russians are here. Instead, all you dumb white trash pieces of shit and colored coons, like my former friend, Abdul Qadim Haq, go to alternative media. Well, alternative media was sewed up tight long time ago. It was sewed up tight preparing for just this very stage of the end of American empire. When America decided it was going to free itself from the Arabs, the Japanese, all the people who had defeated them in the past, by going to a new white savior, Mother Russia. 
Now, I'm preparing for this creation of a Russo-American condominium. George Norney, who is working for Clear Radio and, of course, Clear Channel, was the owner of Premier Radio Network. Clear Channel is owned, in particular, by Rear Emma Bobby Ray Emmett and the millionaire, multimillionaire, Billy Joe Red McCombs, who is a shareholder in Blackwater Mercenary Corporation, which then became Xenon and then became Academy. And George Norrie received direct orders from Admiral Bobby Ray Inman, a federal reservist who ran the Federal Reserve Bank of Texas, just as he did from Admiral Bobby Ray Inman back when he was serving in the Navy as a public relations officer. So George Norrie would always refuse to bring me on to talk about Pearl Harbor. I managed to insinuate my way in there, the professional agent trained in espionage that I am, by Michael Aquino himself, by bringing up my connections with Michael Aquino. How do you think I ever got on to Coast to Coast AM in the first place? It was only after I was on a number of times, Aquino began complaining and saying, hey, Douglas isn't doing this under my orders, you stupid fuck. And that's when George Noy would never have me on again. So you see, I use my background with Michael Aquino to my advantage to inform you about reality before Aquino got in and began to tell Admiral Inman, hey, you got to stop letting this Douglas Dietrich on. It took him over a year because bureaucracies are slow before Admiral Inman got to personally talking with Michael Aquino, realizing this wasn't part of his psyops, and then gave orders to George Noy, make certain you never have that Dietrich on again. He's a rogue element, a renegade agent. He's no longer on our side. But you see, who did George Noy always push? Who did he sell? Who did he promote? Endlessly, ceaselessly, 100%, 200% behind him. Alex fucking Jones. You see, Americans not realizing that they're being propagandized is itself a product of propaganda. So lack of any academic support for scientific inquiry notwithstanding, what else could explain the uniquely American mass shooting epidemic? Surely access to firearms is a factor, but other countries like Switzerland have similarly liberal gun laws without anything like the level of violence seen in the United States. Surely mental health is a factor as well. But neither mental health problems nor lack of health care is a problem unique to the United States. There is nothing like the mass shooting epidemic in the United States anywhere else in the world, nor indeed anywhere else in recorded history. Name me one thing unique to America that could possibly explain its unique mass shooting problem besides the fact that American psyche, the American psyche, the mass mind, is necessarily pummeled with war propaganda day in and day out in order to manufacture consent for American war agendas. And sometimes that mind gets bent so far it breaks. Now, I of course am not saying that firearms or mental health are not factors in this phenomenon. I'm not saying that these aren't debates that Americans should be having with each other or not. But the fact that domestic propaganda can undeniably be found throughout the American alternative media. That's your source of propaganda. Alternative media is Russian propaganda spoken in English for all you dumb fucks to understand. That's the reason that mainstream psychology is completely ignoring the effects of American media coming to you from the sewer level, from out of the gutters, not from the state media machine that it did at the time of the Office of War Information in World War II, because all that ceased to work. Americans began to get cynical. And with that, the only way to take advantage of the cynical American mind was saying, well, it's not the state media anymore. It's not the big boys. It's not conventional media. We're alternative. And so the alternative and the YouTube and the Internet became everyone's source seeking new news. And they got it all from motherfucking Russia, via InfoWars Alex Jones, being promoted by George Norrie, all under direct orders 
of the men who operated with Michael Aquino. Because I knew their inner working so well. Because I worked with Michael Aquino. I knew how to take advantage of their disadvantages. And I got away with a couple of years of exploiting them before they began to listen to Michael Aquino, who at that time was having health issues, suffering from intestinal cancer, dealing with a number of other things that he was dealing with in terms of challenges of relocation. For one thing, avoiding some people trying to kill him out of vengeance because I had exposed him in where he lived in San Francisco. And then, of course, he ran away to New York, into the Montauk area. He got, for a period of time, shelter from Dr. David Lewis Anderson. Then he ran away to Scotland, where he lives now, in his so-called retirement. But his media machine, on behalf of his puppet, Vladimir Putin, controlled through Alexander Dugan, introduced proudly by Alex Jones as Vladimir Putin's brain, a co-religionist of Malikino as much as General Paul Vallely is, who co-authored Mind War. These people are now applying Mind War 24 hours a day. And that is how your alternative media and the new Leviathan rushing out of the sewer of the subconscious psyche of white trash, alternative media is controlling your surface social consciousness. Now that I'm shining the light on it, I'm the most dangerous man in the world. And of course, where do I live? California. Along with the new leader of the resistance, Gavin Newsom. And that's what led to the mass shooting, simultaneous, the arson attacks, and now we're dealing with already the grim task of recovering the dead after just one of three raging wildfires has killed at least a quarter of a hundred people here in the Golden Bear State. At least 25 dead, over a hundred missing. Dozens have been killed in these raging California wildfires. With three wildfires across the state of California only partially contained, fire crews are warning that high winds in coming days may cause the fires to continue to spread. Strong winds, low humidity, they're fueling the Camp Fire, Camp County, California, in Northern California, and the Woolsey and Hill Fires in Southern California. Death toll from the Camp Fire alone reached 23 uh, yesterday. They can hit the third deadliest fire in all recorded state Californian history. That's according to the Associated Press that I sourced. Two other people were found dead from the Woolsey Fire in Southern California. Over 100 people are still missing in Northern California, where the campfires are already the most destructive fire in state history in terms of structure loss. Now, that fire has destroyed it nearly 7,000 homes, including most of the town of Paradise, as I said, where 10 of the total victims lived. That's where they recovered almost a dozen of the two dozen bodies that have been recovered. So at least statewide, at least 300,000 people more than half of those from Los Angeles have been forced from their homes throughout my state from one end to the other. Now, the resident of Thousand Oaks, of course, where that mass shooting left a dozen dead on Wednesday, were among those who fled the flames in addition to celebrities such as Martin Sheen, Kim Kardashian, I think her name is now Kim Kardashian West, Scott Bio, and even Lady Gaga, all while charred cars littered the sides of the roads, and families have become separated as of Saturday. I'm trying to look it up here. The campfire has reached over 105,000 acres. At one point, it was growing more than a football field every fucking second. The Woolsey Fire reached 83,000 acres. The Hill Fire reached 4,500 acres. Most evacuation orders remain in place. Winds are expected to gust between 30 and 50 miles per hour. That's what they did throughout today. Similar conditions have contributed to the fire spread starting Thursday of last week. So acting governor Gavin Newsom has declared a state of emergency for Butte County in the north and for Los Angeles and Ventura counties in the south. And late yesterday, President Donald Trump urged residents via Twitter to listen to evacuation orders from state and local officials. However, of course, his tweet earlier Saturday prompted backlash from firefighters, politicians, and celebrities when Trump threatened to withhold federal payments to California, 
unless the state took up steps to remedy, quote unquote, its poor forest management. Now, here's what I'm reading of the Twitter at real Donald Trump. There's no reason for these massive, deadly and costly forest fires in California, except that forest management is so poor. Billions of dollars are given each year with so many lives lost, all because of gross mismanagement of the forest. Remedy now are no more Fed payments. Now, Trump's already granted the state's request for a presidential emergency declaration, which will dedicate federal resources toward assisting state and local emergency responders. And firefighters have called Trump out as dangerously law wrong on his California wildfires tree. Now, the Camp, Rincon, and Woolsey wildfires that have engulfed so many homes and took dozens of lives in California over the past few days, this is part of the PSYOP. When he follows up with this kind of blow that is attacking the state itself for all the damage that is done by registered Republicans, that, too, is something that I've tried to check into with this David Ian Long. And so far, from what I found out about his political record, which hasn't been released any more than his reason for discharge or his diagnosis by the Marine Corps, I did find out he was registered Republican, just like so many of the arsonists that had been arrested, just like the Polsky guy who was arrested outside of the Reed School where he was trying to lure the girls into his van to use as human meat shields when he started taking the school out. All of this, you've got in the midst of all this devastation, your own president taking a Twitter, sending a tweet, criticizing California's handling of the fires, threatening to withhold federal funding in the future if the state doesn't change the way it approaches wildfire prevention. And yet the firefighting professionals on the ground told him he has no idea of what he's assessing. Brian K. Rice, the president of the California Professional Firefighters Organization, who represents over 30,000 first responders, called out Trump for his totally incorrect facts. On Saturday, Rice issued an official statement, the president's message attacking California and threatening to withhold aid to the victims of the cataclysmic fires is ill-informed, ill-timed, and demeaning to those who are suffering, as well as the men and women on the front lines. Now, here we have the president himself, at real Donald Trump, in another tweet saying over 4,000 are fighting the camp and Woolsey fires in California that burned over 170,000 acres, 52,000 who have evacuated, families of the 11 who have died, the destruction's catastrophic. Now, Royce pointed at all that being correct, and yet the misinformation is the president has attacked the more than 250,000 Californias who fled their homes along with the men and women fighting the fires and saving lives, all for the sake of making a political statement on an issue that is not a red or blue situation. So using simple, detached facts, Rice explained the reason that Trump is incorrect in his tweet. The president's assertion that California's forest management policies are to blame for catastrophic wildfires dangerously wrong. Wildfires are sparked and spread not only in forested areas, but in populated areas and open fields fueled by parched vegetation, high winds, low humidity, and geography. Moreover, nearly 60% of California forests are under federal management, meaning the man responsible for the firefighters is not California, but Donald Trump under his administration. And another two-thirds are under private control, which the Californian government cannot intervene with. It's the federal government that's chosen to divert resources away from forest management at the behest of the privately controlled landholders, not the state of California. In fact, according to UCANR reports, local and state agencies manage only 3% of the forest areas in the entire Golden Bear State of California. So from what I've been able to ascertain by the UCANR, which is an agricultural and natural resources organization. I have taken a look at their websites, and it turns out California does indeed manage only 3% of all forest area within the geographic boundaries of our state. And another group of firefighting professionals has, of course, taken offense spoken out against Trump's inaccurate claims. Harold Schaeckberger, the International Association of Firefighters, General President issued a statement condemning 
Donald Trump, saying President Donald Trump has chosen to respond with an irresponsible, reckless and insulting tweet, criticizing the work being done on the front line to contain these disasters. While firefighters and civilians are still in harm's way, no less, the president has even suggested cutting off necessary funding to keep Americans safe, his own citizens. Why? Because Donald Trump works for the fucking Russians and he wants you dead. He wants to kill Americans. Get it through your fucking head. He's killing Americans through agents like the goddamn Marines who interpret what he says as direct orders. We'll get into that. There's a, for instance, Thursday, thousands of firefighters are risking their lives, working tirelessly to put out the flames as life and property face fiery ruin. Many celebrities are being evacuated. Some have even lost their homes. Images on social media show animals in the region are also facing risks they were unable to escape. Well, just to go into some detail about it, the technology, what causes California's wildfires? How can they be stopped or even just slowed? It might be, aside from the Republican arsonists, the true Russian insurgency of these hostels in our United States. There is the old, anachronistic, obsolete technology. Power lines are also burning the West. Human technology is responsible for more loss from fire than any other cause. But reducing fire's impact will require changes to how people live, not just to the infrastructure that lets them do so. In October of yesteryear, 2017, 250 square miles burned in Northern California, destroying 6,000 homes and businesses, killing over 44 people. For now, the cause of these fires has not been determined other than by myself, who was pointed to the arsonists who were arrested. But aside from that, the private utility company, Pacific Gas and Electric, known to Californians as PG&E, is under investigation. Total damage for the Northern California wildfires comes to nine billion United States dollars. PG&E has started stockpiling cash. In California, it's actually a familiar story. Three years ago, in February of 2015, one third of the houses in remote neighborhoods like Eastern California burned down. And there, before the fire, 100 houses lay scattered across the leeward flank of the Sierra Nevada mountains. The people who lived there spent their time walking steep roads, listening to crickets, chasing mule deer out of the garden, looking over a desert valley below. Days after the fire, uh, of course, they weren't doing any of these things, but doing things like standing around inside their smoking foundations uh, and, of course, uh, looking at what they lost. Now, one of the things that you notice about many of these types of fires, the air smells of sulfur, uh, mostly only dust lingers, as if some great storm had picked up the walls and the roof and furniture and lifted everything away. You might look around uh, for something of sort the rubble, but there's not much rubble to sort. Uh, and like the fires yesteryear in Northern California, the cause of the fire, according to the government database, is always still under investigation. Now, I pointed out the fact that Many of these fires happened in rapid succession to the point where the arsonists were obviously air mobile. They were being airlifted by helicopter from place to place. There's only one other culprit, one source more likely than an arsonist. Strong winds whipping power lines that hang over dry brush. A power line can start a fire if it breaks in the wind. It can start a fire when a tree or a branch falls across it or when lines slap together, or when equipment gets old and fails without anyone noticing. In 2015, fires started by electrical lines and equipment burned more acres in California than any other officially stated cause. Power lines sparked fires that set records in New Mexico and fed a blaze in Great Smoky Mountains National Park that entered the city of Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and killed 14 people the year before yesteryear, 2016. In recent years, They've consistently been among the three major causes of California wildfires. Hurricane force winds periodically shriek off the Pacific and rattle California. Wind strong enough to break a power line spreads fire fast. This past October, when people were sniffing the air and finding 
that California was once again burning. I could smell smoke right here in San Francisco. It was bad enough where my medical cosmetologist, who lives in San Mateo or San Bruno, I'm, I really shouldn't give the area she's living in, but in the greater San Francisco Bay Area metroplex region, she developed blinding headaches because the smoke was just getting so strong from all of these fires burning our state to the ground. But if you're really close, and you can really sniff the fire crawling up on your ass, if you look around, you might see a lot of wires thatching an orange sky. Now, that might be half a hundred miles from the fires per se, and you could just sit inside whoever gives you some shelter and watch the noon sun dim, watch darkness at noon. But when it comes to how these fires start, dry leaves lay in the piles beside wooden walls. You've got uh, everybody vulnerable, even if they maintain plenty of defensible space. And, uh, of course, all it takes is the next windstorm. Now, power companies, of course, should put their lines underground. In 1995, fire-related costs ate up 16% of the U.S. Forest Service budget. By 2015, half that budget has been devoted to fire. Now, our power cannot be safe when utility company profits drive power corporations or operations they perform, PG&E has been found guilty already of negligence before in wildfires. And it may be a combination of negligence and greed again this time. There's a precedent for fire occurring alongside an infrastructure that drives economic growth from 1870 until the 1920s, being a Department of Defense research librarian. And of course, fire was ultimately taken as a national security issue during World War II with the Japanese balloon bombs. Records on preceding fires noted that major fires, most of them in America, were caused by locomotives. Now that problem was fixed. New laws were enforced, fines and lawsuits applied economic pressure, engines were compelled to replace coal with oil as fuel, suitable spark arresters were invented, rights of way were cleaned of debris, lines were patrolled, and so locomotives started wildfires for decades, but not forever. And like railroads, power lines deliver a seemingly limitless supply of product wherever people want it. On a good day, the grid makes life easy. Far from urban centers, in those houses up on the sides of mountains, bordering California and Nevada, in an ocean of dry brush, the lights still flick on. In general, power lines only cause fire when things go wrong above ground. Even utility companies agree. After a 2012 study by the Edison Electric Institute revealed that underground lines have had fewer problems during storms and are better for public safety all around. But California still has 210,000 miles of electrical lines. The cost to put lines underground is about one million United States dollars per mile to start, and much more so in mountainous areas. That's five to ten times what it costs to hang a line overhead, which usually makes underground lines logistically or economically impractical. In Northern California, for example, a plan to put power lines underground was dropped because utility rates in the impacted area would have risen by 125 percent. So despite the impulse to blame industry, the power companies aren't entirely in control of the solution. California utility companies don't get to decide how much line they'll install underground. That matter is regulated by the Public Utilities Commission in order to protect consumers, safeguard the environment, and assure Californians access to safe and reliable utility infrastructure. That's according to the organization's stated mission that I looked up. The commission balances risk with cost and limits how much utility companies can spend by putting wires underground. Other improvements to the grid are being investigated, including better line insulation and technology that could anticipate line failure and shut off power in advance, but all of these solutions will be slow and costly to implement. But uh, even though all consumers might get angry with the utility companies, they like to turn lights on in the dark. So in the United States, it's fossil fuels burned to make electricity and heat 
that put more greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere than any other industry. So you've got all these houses burning in California amid these terrible droughts, some of the worst that California has ever seen in a thousand years. In recent decades, wildfires in the American West have begun to range further and burn longer. And scientists from eight universities got together the year before yesteryear, 2016, looked at the tendencies in wildfire and the ways we manage it. And they concluded that wildfires across Western North America have increased in number and size over the past three decades. This trend will continue in response to further global warming. But this, a new climate error. An error. The wildfire age. The age of the burning lands, the burning west. Fires burn bigger areas, destroy three times as many houses as they used to. What was once a problem in June, July, and August, the summer months now extends through November and beyond. People used to evacuate for avalanche warnings in the winters of their childhood in the mountain areas of California. But in February of 2015, They'd be gaping at new patches of sky as smoke seeped out of the ground. So when a fire comes up the side of these mountains and destroys homes, people say natural disaster. When lightning starts that fire, they say natural disaster. When power lines start that fire, unfortunately, all these dumb motherfuckers, consumers, mind you, not the corporations, still say natural disaster. Deliberate debris burning, firework, rogue campfires are among the most common causes of so-called wildfire in some parts of uh, California. But when people consider wildfire, even wildfire caused by human tools, it tends to seem to them as inescapable as lightning. So many of these people have to move and they live in places now like San Francisco, where I've met and spoken to many of them. And, of course, I've known one of them who's taken, like people who suffered a mass shooting and become advocates for trauma. I know one fire survivor who prefers to remain anonymous, who now prepares environmental impact reports for federal and state agencies. Now, this individual, a she, her parents live in a house rebuilt atop the ashes of the old one. But the smell of the smoke throughout that construction and throughout the home after it was built, made her nauseous. And she said she woke up in the middle of the night, could still smell it, as well as any fires burning around Napa and Sonoma. So they moved to places like San Francisco, where there's far more concrete. But it's noted that when people treat fire as an inevitability, all of its consequences become divorced from human behavior. And what she, she's the person whose computers I got so much of my information of from when I couldn't access uh, my own uh, search engine for a while there for the reasons we articulated earlier. When she saw on the local news after the Northern California fires, or what she saw was that stories of people and families of homes, people, family, homes over and over again, it makes sense because people's lives have changed. But that's always the focus instead of the bigger issue. Instead of, could this have been prevented? And there's a reason that it's happened and it's connected to our infrastructure. But it's obviously something people do not want to talk about. And that's what sickens her. To feel the fire's heat, to smell smoke. And yet people are still entirely unwilling, totally unwilling to face its implications. Those implications are, of course, complicated. That's why it's so hard to face up to. Many of the problems of fire management don't have technical fixes. They depend on social choices hammered out in politics, appropriate land use, the purpose of public lands, competing economic interests, cultural values, philosophies. So it's possible to update technology to dodge disaster to a point. We can make advanced warning systems for earthquakes, cloak first responders in NASA-developed fire suits, mitigate rising sea levels with permeable pavement and rain gardens. We can also update technology to avoid having to change the assumptions that caused some of the problems in the first place. When locomotives burn forests, people change the mechanics of train. 
they didn't reevaluate the long-term viability of rail. The need to move thousands of tons of lumber and coal and food and passengers at high speed through forest and prairie and desert did not come into question. It was easier to quick fix than it was to change culture. This brings us into biology. Some biologists contend that our brains did not evolve to conceive of the long-term consequences of our choices, that we're not primed to master deep time, but to put out small fires, if you will. But it appears we have also evolved to comprehend the far future, if only in flashes. We operate not according to strict evolutionary selection, but in the realm of culture, which is to say, the realm of choice and confusion. But the night after this mass shooting, when I saw in later footage with this friend of mine who files these special reports, neighborhoods going up in smoke 2,000 miles away. I also sat on the floor, held the phone to my ear, while some of her relations described their mountain burning again. And that people were gathering things from their childhood bedroom around them like talismans and imagining the world in flames. Now, some of these houses have survived the fire, and that's because of heroes like a volunteer fire captain who drove up his street in a fire truck, saw his own house burning, had the presence of mind to keep moving, to keep working to save what remained. He or another volunteer doused the flames that devoured a pile of railroad ties in people's yards, the family, the parents of this woman that I know in this case, flames that could have laddered up uh, their brush hill and laced fingers through the railings of the porch. Now, eventually, scientists say wildfires in the United States might dwindle. This could happen when precipitation withers to the point that vegetation doesn't come back. The fires will end when there's nothing more to burn. Now, I would like to choose a world in which there is a lot left to lose. We would prefer to protect our homes in California, not to mention our larger communities, not to mention the global climate, direct our lives in ways that will save what we love. I'm certain others would as well. Last October, somebody put up signs in Sonoma right across the bay from San Francisco saying the love in the air is thicker than the smoke. So for those of us in this state living in the path of wildfire, we've come to understand that we must live with it, that no quick solution awaits us, that changing the ways we think and being open about new ways of living might protect our communities. Fire as we know it is largely the outcome of what this creature has done and not done. Humans have changed fire and fire will change us. One way or another, all animals have an element. The birds have the skies, the fish have the waters and the seas. With human beings, that element is fire. Our entire evolution is driven by our harnessing fire. We can try to choose the way. This means either smarter technology already in the works. Maybe it means new relationships with fire, making fire a tool again, listening to the people who understand fire when it's time to rebuild and rebuilding in different ways or even in different places. And science would advise we can choose to accept wildfire as an inevitable catalyst of change, and we can adapt. Here in the United States, the American empire, an empire nation that currently suppresses 95% of all wildfires at great cost and with questionable efficacy, it might be best to focus more on guiding the way fire burns. Communities can put more resources into controlled burns more than 99% of which stay within selected boundaries and teach the public about their benefit. Local governments can help educate and support landowners in fuel removal and property protection. And both residents and developers can think carefully before they build farther and farther into the wilderness, which is after all fires country. And yet it's hard to work to change more than the technology to change ourselves in order to accommodate and support these adaptations. It's easy instead to slip back into life as we know it, to forget what a new era may ask of us, even when the stakes are very high. And despite the fact that I feel as passionately about these issues as the lady who gave me access to her computer, the fact that they impact us all personally and we think about them day to day, 
then there's those of us, of course, who don't. And that's life. The slow build of the wind on the Pacific, the heave of power over our heads, in spider webs of cables that cover the sky, predicted by the Hopi Indians. All of that is something that's part of what we're going to deal with as we evolve. But it's more than that in the immediate sense. It's the war against California by the Republican administration because we're the greatest source of resistance and the only hope for the future. Their terrorism by mass shootings and fires has resulted in more people leaving the state of California today, this year, than people moving into it. This is war. We have evacuees. We have refugees. We have DPs or displaced persons. There are people migrating out of California now because of the relentless Republican insurgency, assault on our bodies, assault on our property, assault on our psyche and our minds. That's what brings us back to what Stephen Myers said. Stephen Myers, shout out to him, friend of mine who sometimes has sent some financial support, says, don't know if you'll talk about this mass shooter that killed and wounded all these people, but it is quite a bit odd. Some were survivors of the Vegas shooting. The witnesses said he knew like he, he, he knew what he was doing like a robot. Reminds me of the movie Cabin in the Woods where the elite Satanists set up people for ritual sacrifice to the anti-gods and watch it on a TV screen as the carnage unfolds. I know in the circle of Satanists, they sell snuff films in the black market to each other for entertainment, and they get an orgasm when they see people suffer and die in pain. And as they watch it, they have orgies among each other. And another movie is Hostile, where they show you the real world, just a thought to ponder. That brings us back to not only the spread of the fires, The mass shootings in America are spreading like a disease. It seems like the shootings are becoming more frequent. It might be because mass murder can catch on like an epidemic. 26 people shot dead in Sutherland Springs, November 5th. 49 people shot dead in Las Vegas, October 1st. 49 people shot dead in Orlando, June 12th. All yesteryear, last year that I'm thinking of. These are three of the five worst mass shootings in modern U.S. history. All happened in the past two years, last year and the year before yesteryear, when I think about it. Two occurred within the same two months. Is there a connection? Now, several years ago, Mr. Malcolm Gladwell wrote an article in The New Yorker positing that a national school shootings that they might spread like a disease. He cited the models of Mark Granovether, a Stanford University sociologist whose theory of social influence thresholds explained the gathering force of a riot. Imagine an avalanche where the first trash of snowpack to move might be quite unsteady, but as a wave of snow gathers force, it becomes powerful enough to dislocate even the most stable trees and houses. Similarly, a riot might begin with one wild rebel throwing a rock through a window just to get a rush. It becomes a public movement when the momentum is powerful enough to move even the relatively stable people nearby to join in the rock early. In this way, a spate of mass shootings might behave like a slow motion riot, such that each murderous event normalizes or encourages new participants to join the movement. Now, at the time, Gladwell's conjecture was marked for its suggestiveness. After all, there wasn't much evidence to support the claim that Granovetter's threshold theories applied to mass shootings that were separated by many months and committed by strangers who had had no chance of meeting. But according to a 2015 paper out of Arizona State University, Contagion in Mass Killings and School Shootings, that being the title thereof, There be some data that mass shootings often occur in bunches, which indicates that they infect new potential murderers, not unlike a disease. This is why it's called mental illness, people. If you are locked in and forced to interact with crazy people, you will go insane. And in the paper entitled Contagion and Mass Killings and School Shootings, I will quote therefrom. 
We find significant evidence that mass killings involving firearms are incented by similar events in the immediate past. Suicide and terrorism, too, have been found to be likewise contagious. Interestingly, the authors of this study found no significant association between the rate of school and mass shootings and the state's prevalence of mental illness. Meaning, mental illness and mass shootings are not connected from a sociological perspective. Diseases spread among individuals, but the contagion of mass shootings seems to spread through broadcast media. Now, Sherry Towers, the Atlanta, Arizona State University paper's lead author, in an interview with The Atlantic Magazine in 2015, hypothesized that television, radio, and other media exposure might be the vectors through which one mass shooting infects the next perpetrator. Like a commercial, each event's extraordinary coverage offers accidental advertising for depravity. One reason why mass media coverage of shootings might inspire more shootings is that public glorification inspires some mass murderers. Eric Harris, the central planner of the Columbine murders, wrote, Ich bin Gott, German for I am God, in his school planner. It's hard to say what lessons this community could take from such findings. Mass shootings have inherent and unambiguous news value. It's absurd to suggest that the media ignore them entirely. But perhaps journalists should cover such events with an awareness that even noble coverage can advertise. Some media critics endorse a don't name the method, whereby mass shooters are deliberately left anonymous. But readers and viewers are fascinated by the motives and details of mass shootings, and it's unlikely that they tolerate such an approach. So with that in mind, the liberal progressive magazine Mother Jones has suggested minimizing the use of the perpetrator's name, limiting headshots, banning outright any potentially aggrandizing photographs. Now, the mass shooting contagion paper, of course, ought not to be the final word on the effect of mass media on gun violence. The United States spends millions of dollars tracking other causes of disasters, such as tornadoes, which have been about as deadly as mass shootings in the past half century. But research on mass shootings, you might find interesting, is almost non-existent. It's so sparse that it's obvious that such research is actively discouraged. That brings us back to Michael Aquino. But we'll get back into that when we get back. I'm going to take a break. We're going to enter our fourth, hopefully last hour, of our program tonight, because I do want to conclude with things that are extraordinarily important in this case because it's so important nationally, especially in light of what's going on against California under this administration. And because of that, of course, I'll need to take a small break. I'll be back. You stay right there. Okay. Fourth and hopefully final hour here. If we do run a little past that, it'd only be for a few minutes. Uh, hopefully I can uh, cover everything within this last hour. When I speak of the research on mass shootings being suppressed uh, for every intention of uh, preventing the general public from knowing the psychological operations against them being deployed by men like Michael Aquino and now today by Vladimir Putin in conjunction and cooperation with Michael Aquino. That lack of research explains why there aren't any standard methodologies, definitions, or even conclusions about the frequency or causes of mass massacres. Exempli Gratia, an analysis by the liberal progressive magazine Mother Jones, starting in 2012, found that mass shootings killing four or more people have become more frequent in the past few decades. But a separate analysis by Grant Dew, surname spelled D-U-W-E, Dew, perhaps, the research director at the Minnesota Department of Corrections, found that while the mass shooting rate has not increased since the 1970s, the number of victims has grown steadily since the year 2000s, the early 2000s, the aughts as they're known, uh, through the teens, meaning 2010 through uh, 2020, essentially. And, uh, of course, uh, during this period of time, shootings have taken down more and more people at a time. So 
the research director at the Minnesota Department of Corrections, Grant Dua, supposes that the rising deadliness of mass shootings might be most responsible for the growing perception that these events are becoming more common since the number of casualties and fatalities is the strongest predictor of media coverage. Altogether, it's a scary story, no matter which side is correct. Given the contagion research, one can imagine a sinister feedback loop that might explain the recent spate of murderous sprees. If more victims mean more media coverage, and more coverage means more inspiration, it implies that historically violent mass shootings might be the most contagious. Mass shootings are often committed by lonely and unrooted men, suffering from both grandiose aspirations and petty grievances. The post-mortem descriptors are practically rote. He was cold, weird, withdrawn, a loner, and one must always know, forever and always and inescapably, without any exception, he, 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 always a fucking male. It's astonishingly rare to read the A antonyms. He is almost never warm, welcoming, the most popular kid in the school. Never. When, even when mass shootings are not, strictly speaking, terrorism, they still seem to adhere to a sort of dank and nearly invisible ideology of oppressive self-aggrandizement, a bid for greatness that requires the destruction of others. Just because there be no formal institution like ISIS to symbolize this strain of white rage, another inescapable rule, almost without exception, what few exceptions there are, simply prove the rule that it's white rage. White trash, pieces of shit. Just because there's no formal institution to unite this sewer of white shit doesn't mean the white rage isn't ideological. Many instances of white male mass shooting violence are in fact driven by media inspired religion of grievance and greatness, a mass distributed sickness for which white male outcasts are most vulnerable to infection. They're the most practical vectors. They're the most dangerous contagion carriers on earth. Now, President Donald Trump himself claimed he Today, in a brief address from Tokyo, or was it a few days ago? I'm trying to remember because I know he's been traveling. He's in, of course, France right now. And, of course, I was watching Tokyo News, so it looked almost as if it were coming from Tokyo to me. But he did state this isn't a gun situation. That's what he always claims, because he's in the pocket of the Russian terrorist network, the National Rifle Association. The statistics, on the other hand, antithetical to Donald Trump's fallacious lies, offer no doubt. There are more gun deaths in America simply because there's many more fucking guns than anywhere else in the world. There is a firearm for every single American citizen and beyond. The American rates of firearm homicide, child firearm mortality, and firearms related suicide are far higher by orders of magnitude than any other industrialized nation on earth. The United States, home to 5% of the industrialized world's population under 15 years of age, accounts for 87% of its unintentional firearms fatalities involving that age group. That's according to a 2003 paper I've just sourced and looked up online. Mass killings are an epidemic that so many leaders refuse to name or even to see. If America cannot amend the laws that facilitate such violence, it should at least commit more resources to studying why this seems to be a paradoxical age of historically low crime, yet contagious mass murder. Well, I can tell you why. We now have a puppet president of the Russians who both condones and encourages political violence. Now, during the time when we had the mass shootings in the synagogue combining with the letter bombs being sent, a mass assassination attempt. Trump's statement during that 48 hour period revealed himself willing to breach a core rule of democracy. Bombs were sent through the mail to CNN, George Soros, James Clapper, 
former President Barack Obama, other persons targeted by the president, Donald Trump himself, for vilification and abuse. And then a theory begins to circulate on the far edges of the right that the bombs are a false flag intended to discredit the president and his party. And that theory rapidly moved from the edge to the center. There the theory lingered, even as the police apprehended the man, Caesar Sayak Jr., after the FBI finally consulted with a fellow male stripper, though they had never physically met, Daniel Arola, our brother in battle. That's how the police were able to apprehend Caesar Sayak Jr. and tow away a van festooned with unabashedly pro-Trump stickers. But on the afternoon of October 24th, the false flag theory was all but endorsed by Rush Limbaugh. And so in the midst of this atmosphere, we had a series of bombs, according to Rush Limbaugh, said today exclusively to Democrats. And it just, there's a small test that this stuff has to pass. And so far, a lot of people's noses are in the air, not quite certain of what to make of this. This is just, it's not Republicans that show up, for example, at the offices of the family. What is it? What is it? Some pro-life group's offices. Some guy shows up with a gun and was going to shoot people. Got caught before he was able to shoot anyone. Family Research Center, I think. Yeah. I'm reading from Rush Limbaugh here. He says, and I'm still reading Rush Limbaugh, mind you. Republicans just don't do this kind of thing. Even though every event, like mass shootings, remember, every mass shooting there is, the Democrats and the media try to make everybody think right off the bat that some Tea Partier did it, or some talk radio fan did it, or some Fox News viewer did it. Turns out, it's never ever the case. Not one of these bombs went off, and if a Democrat operative's purpose here is to make it look like, hey, you know, there are mobs everywhere, the mobs are not just Democrat mobs. I mean, look at this. You've got people here trying to harm CNN and Obama and Hillary and Bill Clinton and Debbie Blabbermouth Schultz. It just it might serve a purpose here. So on the afternoon of October 25th, the false flag theory, this is Douglas Dietrich talking again, gained a respectful hearing from the Federalist Molly Hemingway, a Fox News contributor, one of the president's most outspoken defenders on television and uh, social media, who in a tweet compared the current uh, incident at that time to the anthrax attacks in the fall of 2001, which I found odd because you can hear the anthrax attacks on 911 TV. If you look that up on YouTube, Douglas Dietrich speaks to the 9-11 attacks, the, the anthrax attacks. And what she said were, people should stop acting like it's insane to even consider possibility of hidden motivations in latest terrorism by mail scheme since last such scheme targeting political media establishment did just that, pretending to be al-Qaeda when they were not. Now, that same afternoon, a tweet from an anonymous account that alleged fake bombs may scare and pick up blue sympathy vote gained a like from no one less than Donald Trump Jr., and on 10, 37 a.m. on October 26th, the false flag theory was winkingly endorsed on Twitter by the president himself, saying Republicans are doing so well in early voting and at the polls. Now this bomb stuff happens and the momentum greatly shows news, not talking politics. Very unfortunate what's going on. Republicans go out and vote. Now, it's striking that the president did not offer a word of sympathy for any of the targets of the bombs ever. After all, even if the false flag three were true to any degree, the people targeted were indeed targeted. The motives or identity of the would-be bomber does not mitigate the shock and threat to the person receiving the bomb, including the line of dirty security personnel who, in their line of dirty duty, encountered the bombs sent to Obama and others whose mail is screened for them. The president did offer a generalized perfunctory condemnation of political violence at a rally in Wisconsin on October 24th, calling the bombs an attack on democracy itself, since they all went to Democrats. And it's interesting to say it wasn't an attack on the republic, because, of course, no Republican received them. And, of course, he urged all sides to come together in peace and harmony. Yet, even within those apparently obviously scripted remarks, he couldn't refrain from an attack on the media institutions that had been targeted by the bomber. He said, the media also has a responsibility to set a civil tone and to stop the endless hostility and constant negative and oft times false attacks and stories. Now, later in the rally, in apparently unscripted remarks, he added an extra jibe all his own. The media, he said, can't take a joke. The closest the president could come to an appropriate comment on the attacks was to retreat with the words, I agree wholeheartedly, a very correct statement by Vice President Mike Pence, midday on October 24th which was, we condemn the attempted attacks against President Obama, 
interesting he referred to him as such, the Clintons at CNN and others. These cowardly actions are despicable and have no place in this country. Grateful for swift response of Secret Service, FBI, local law enforcement. Those responsible will be brought to justice. Now, suspicion that this retweet originated with the president's communication team rather than the president himself was all but confirmed when at 17, 7.18 a.m. in the morning on Thursday after the bombs were discovered on Wednesday, an hour of the day when the president was secluded and alone, he tweeted a much more vicious sentiment. He states, I quote here, a very big part of the anger we see today in our society is caused by the purposefully false and inaccurate reporting of the mainstream media that I refer to as fake news. It's gotten so bad and hateful that it's beyond description. Mainstream media must clean up its act fast or else. And he returned to that theme early on Friday morning. Funny how lowly rated CNN and others can criticize me as well at will, even blaming me for the current spate of bombs and ridiculously comparing this to September 11th and the Oklahoma City bombing. Yet when I criticize them, they go wild and scream. Now, when people talk about Trump condoning and inviting political violence, his behavior over that 48 hour period and that of his followers is exactly what they have in mind. The utter lack of sympathy for those attacked or threatened the readiness to blame victims of terrorism for being terrorized, as they did California by saying you didn't manage your forest when it's all being managed technically by Donald Trump while it's burning to the ground. The determination to exonerate the president of any consequences for his own wild behavior, the indulgence of wild conspiracy theories as a means to achieve that exoneration, piped directly into the Oval Office from the furthest far-right extremes of American life, now, only yesterday, Menzies, last month, Trump praised a Republican member of Congress who physically attacked a reporter without provocation and then lied to the police about the attack. He praised this man and praised his lying to the police just one week before all those bombs reached all their respective destinations. And then, on the day the bombs were uncovered, Trump claimed there was a conspiracy to blame him for the bombs mailed to CNN and other people he had publicly targeted with his abuse. And that claim wasn't Trump's alone. It was echoed by many of the apologists and defenders of his government. Now, democracy, not the constitutional republic, but the concept of democracy itself has a rule, an absolute prohibition on the use of threat or violence to coerce political ends. Trump walked the road away from democracy. And he's not walking alone because Trump's condemnations of violence aren't convincing his supporters. He's given the nation no reason to think his disavowals are sincere. Since the beginning of his presidential campaign, Donald Trump weaponized his insincerity and the bad faith of his supporters in order to deny his own accountability for the things he does and believes. If critics take Trump's praise for mass deportations or internment camps at face value, they're guilty of taking Trump too literally. If Trump praises violence against the media or calls for a foreign government to aid his campaign, his detractors are informed that the president is only kidding. When he absolutely isn't. Whenever Trump says or does anything horrible, his defenders insist he did not actually do or say it and then attack Trump's critics for misrepresenting him. Yet everyone involved in the charade knows which Trump is the real Trump. His defenders most of all, because it's why they worship him. During the 2016 campaign, reporters and political analysts would frequently discuss a hypothetical Trump pivot, imagining the moment when he would cease his appeals to prejudice or use of casual falsehoods in order to embrace a more traditional political persona that's never happened. After Trump assumed the presidency, those desperate for the pivot that never came indulged in another frequently mocked rhetorical device. Whenever Trump publicly performed the traditional duties of the office in a satisfactory fashion, they declared that this was the day he became president. Inevitably, Trump would immediately return to form. Now, we don't often hear either of those rhetorical devices invoked anymore. The beginning and the end was when Trump initially condemned the white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, that ended with the ritual sacrifice of the counter-protester Heather Heyer, a breeding age white woman, and then turned around and insisted that there were some very fine people on both sides 
Despite Trump's initial condemnation, white nationalists were left convinced that the president, whatever his aides might persuade him to say publicly, was sympathetic to their movement and indeed their Führer, their leader, their Messiah. This all established a clear pattern. Fake Trump is magnanimous. Real Trump is petty. Fake Trump represents all Americans. Real Trump cares only about his white trash sewer shit that serves as his base. And the colored coons, the occasional colored turds that fall into the sewage. The problem's not, as some have suggested, an eroding standard of civility in political discourse. Even early in the republic, politics at the presidential level was quite off nasty. But there'd be a distinction between speech that be mean, objectionable, or even false, and speech that explicitly justifies violence. In a democracy, civility is optional. Nonviolence is essential, which is why American presidents must genuinely condemn political violence against their opponents. That's what makes Trump's frequent, obvious insincerity so dangerous, because there'd be times when the president must be trusted. Now, when Caesar Sayak, that 56-year-old Florida Republican, like all these other registered Republicans doing so much ill around the United States, when he in particular was arrested for sending explosive devices to Democratic leaders and prominent Trump critics, including CNN. For that week preceding, the president had issued the rote condemnations of political violence that one would expect from a U.S. president. The problem was there was no reason to believe he meant a word of it. Trump has not made any gestures of sympathy towards those targeted ever, instead framing himself as the true victim of an attempt to assassinate leaders of the opposition party. Somebody has tried to kill, in a mass assassination, the majority of party leaders on the side opposing him, and yet he is framed as the victim, suggesting that the anger that led to the bombs was a result of the media being too critical of him. Then he praised, just a week before all of the bombs were let loose, a congressman who, in an act of utter cowardice physically attacked a reporter who asked him a reasonable question. And at other times, the president has encouraged his supporters to attack anti-Trump protesters by offering to pay their legal bills. In the meantime, the Republican Party has been running ads accusing Democrats of encouraging violence, even as the president does just that openly, publicly, remorselessly, and with impunity. A gambit. Some in the media have rewarded by suggesting that left-wing protesters heckling politicians in restaurants is a kind of violence. And an irony of this discourse is that reactionary Trump defenders and some in the media have adopted a version of the off-parodied argument among some on the left that words can constitute violence. Left-wing words are violence, and right-wing violence is just words. Suffice it to say that individuals on both the left and the right are capable of political violence. As we saw with the mass shooting at a congressional baseball practice that ended with Republican Representative Steve Scalise being shot and nearly killed. Neither side of the aisle necessarily has a monopoly on virtue. Leaders from both parties should take care to ensure they're not encouraging violence from their supporters. Nevertheless, in the United States, acts of terrorism on the far right are so exceedingly more common than on the far left that we can say with conviction that no figure in the Democratic Party has ever celebrated or encouraged political violence against opponents the way Donald Trump has done openly and relentlessly since well before he even assumed the office through Russian hacking. Now, people might say Trump's not personally responsible for the actions of a lone bomber, but he is responsible for how he handles those actions and for the messages he sends to his supporters about the acceptability of political violence. And during an appearance at the White House for an event with a black conservative group, during that period of time when all the synagogue and bombs were going down, Trump told reporters, We must never allow political violence to take root in America. We can't let it happen. And I'm committed to doing everything in my power as president to stop it and to stop it now. And shortly afterward, some of those assembled began chanting Soros, referring to George Soros, 
the wealthy Jewish philanthropist who's been an eternal object of right-wing conspiracy theories and who was targeted with a bomb just earlier that week. Then they chanted, lock him up, and CNN sucks. While Trump laughed at all the stupid niggers in this black conservative group that were his house niggers without even being whipped. The president condemned political violence and called for unity, and not even his own black supporters believed it, because they, like Trump, were in on the joke. And that's what led to that deadly night out. It was country college night at the borderline bar and grill as people danced, watched a Lakers game, or played pool. Then a stupid fucking Marine Corps veteran bursts in, kills 12 people, in Thousand Oaks, California. And of course, he was there for someone special. It wasn't the girl who spurned him. It was another Marine. It was a Marine who helped veterans adjust to coming home. Since returning home from Southwest Asia, what you Americans call the Middle East, Dan Manrique, a Latin American a brown Marine had devoted his time to helping veterans adjust to coming home. So the California shooting victim was one Marine killing another Marine who helped other vets. Friendly fire. Target blue. Blue on blue. That's what all these motherfucking American military do. Just like what I described in Operation Desert Storm. My enemies were never the Iraqis in front of me. It was the goddamn Marines behind me that I was out for. They were the ones who would have killed me if I had given them half a chance. So, the targeted victim of the California shooting rampage was a former Marine who happened to be one of color who had helped other military members adjust to civilian life when they returned from overseas. Daniel Manrique, 33 years of age, had received a new job with an organization that works to help veterans just before he was fatally shot by this David Lone Peace White. I, I can't even go there. Now, the relative who survives the man David Long killed, Gladys Manley Kosak, surname spelled K-O-S-C-A-K, Kosak, said that Daniel had spent his entire adult life post-military service helping veterans readjust to civilian life. The organization, Team Red, White, and Blue, which works with veterans, said Manrique was an employee and they were heartbroken to share the news of his death. And uh, there's a reason for this. It's the same reason that when I was gang stalked by John Victor Lillier, Master Sergeant of the U.S. Army Green Berets, that was a man who spent his life bashing veterans who helped veterans, which, of course, I was doing on Coast to Coast AM before Michael Aquino made certain I was blocked from that show forever. You can listen to my Coast to Coast AM interviews with... Another faggot who wound up selling out. A man who said he was too scared to interview me anymore. The idiot, John B. Wells. Whose ratings went way up, higher than George Norris because of his interviews with my son. Enough to establish him an audience base, which then he took and ran with when he started Caravan to Midnight. So, another example of this kind of victimization would be Paul Rykoff, a veteran of the Iraq War. After his return from Iraq, Mr. Rykoff founded the organization IAVA, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. IAVA is widely respected. As a result, Mr. Rykoff welds considerable influence and likewise has a considerable number of enemies who wish to see him fall. These self-declared enemies operate the website, This Ain't Hell. But you can see it from here. There are Kino cultists who want to create hell on earth. 
John Victor Lillier was their master cultist, the leader of their coven. They tried to destroy Mr. Reichoff. They accused Mr. Reichoff of unauthorized wearing of both a low-rated award, a bronze star for notorious service, kind of like showing up to school on time, and a unit patch, of all things. Specific allegations along with a statement. All of this. Reichoff, of course, was astonished. He was uh, offended. He didn't understand why, but things have happened to other people in the veterans community, anyone who helped other veterans adjust. All of these people were attacked by John Victor Lillier. And of course, his gay lover, Mark Seavey. The end result was of course, many lives have been destroyed And many veterans who would have received some kind of socialization don't get it. And as a result, they become mass shooters. So it's imperative. Men like Douglas Dietrich. Men like Rykoff of IAVA. These men, if you can't kill them outright, you character assassinate them. And before he took on Douglas Dietrich, John Victor Lillier was known as a million dollar a hit character assassin. He almost destroyed the life of Paul Rico. But then he took on Aquino's own master pupil, the man who was supposed to inherit the Temple of Set, the man who would have let the anti gods into the world. And now John Victor Lilly is dead. Because even in the darkest of times, acts of kindness shine bright. In Thousand Oaks, California, hundreds of people lined up to donate blood after the mass shootings there. Now being someone who's not entirely baseline human and is hematophagic in his tendencies, being Dampier, or half vampire myself, or rather a quarter thereof, I'm someone who's spoken of my sanguivorous tendencies, and I know a lot more about the blood trade out of necessity than most people do. We don't need you to immediately donate blood to support the victims of the Thousand Oaks shooting. The American Red Cross has stated that blood was already on the shelves that helped during emergencies like what happened in Thousand Oaks. Still, I do emphasize the need for blood is always constant. Those who wish to give blood can visit www.redcrossblood.org to learn more. And, of course, Lorena High School at 106 West Jans Road had a pre-planned blood drive Thursday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Because the blood was not equipped to handle a surge in donors after the shooting, Tony Wevera, the head of that school, asked interested donors to sign up at vitalant.org or he also gave the phone number 877-25-VITAL that's uh, 877-84825 as the first step that was then this is days past now the best thing you can do at this point is probably donate money to get money if you're willing to, to donate some fiscal support to the survivors of the Thousand Oaks shooting The Rotary Club of Westlake Village, a certified charity on GoFundMe, is accepting donations to support the victims. Follow up on that. Also, the Ventura County Community Foundation, in coordination with the City of Thousand Oaks California Community Foundation and others, has set up a victim relief and recovery fund. And, of course, uh, in terms of finding counseling, something that I take a personal interest in for people in these situations, For people in the area who might be listening to me, the American Red Cross has opened a family reunification center at the Thousand Oaks Teen Center at 1375 East Jans Road, where trained mental health volunteers can assist anyone who needs support. Engaged Therapy at 660 Hampshire Road in Westlake Village is offering free individual and group support to those affected by the shooting. Walk-in support is available still this week, as far as I can understand it, from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., a community support group will meet from 6 to 7.30 p.m. So anyone who has questions about that, call 
one dash eight zero five forward slash four nine seven zero six zero five. That's eighteen oh five four ninety seven oh six oh five. And Moore Park College is offering drop in crisis counseling for students and employees until five PM at the Student Health Center at A one 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 one, I think. A triple one. A one one one. And for questions please call one dash eight zero five forward slash three seven eight one four one three. That's eighteen oh five three seventy eight fourteen thirteen. Uh, additional services will be made available throughout the remainder of this week. And of course, uh, probably at this point, it's imperative to get to the fact that the gunman, David Long, posted to social media even as he opened fire at the Thousand Oaks Bar in California, saying, I hope people call me insane. And then David Long at the bar, even posted on Facebook during the massacre, observing that he was bored while actively killing 12 people. This brings us to one of the major points tonight. Mark Zuckerberg is more dangerous than Donald Trump. Now, I call it like it is. When somebody's a black trash piece of shit, a white trash piece of shit, a goop trash piece of shit, here we have a Jew trash piece of shit. By controlling the attention of over 2 billion people, Mark Zuckerberg is tearing up the fabric of society and destroying democracy. U.S. President Donald Trump sits in the Oval Office as the big boss of the world's largest military. He has his finger on the nuclear trigger and kill it. He can kill anyone with a drone strike. Conventional wisdom therefore dictates that the famously thin-skinned former reality TV star who tweets crazy stuff at 3 a.m is the most dangerous man on the planet. But that's not really true. Today, nearly half of American adults get their news on Facebook. They see what their friends share in the ads that the social media network sends their way. During the 2016 US presidential election, Cambridge Analytica, acronymous as Cam Anal, like the point of view cams in uh, porn that stick out of a person's anus, so a person can see the incoming pelvis while it's vaginally fucking the chick whose ass the camera's stuck in, cam anal. That same organization used personal data of 87 million Facebook members to send them fake news from Russia. Initially, Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, rejected the evidence that fake news had influenced the election as, quote unquote, a pretty crazy idea. It transpires we live in a crazy world. And the 34-year-old Zuckerberg is the father of 72-year-old Donald Trump. As Neil Ferguson, a Scottish historian at Harvard and Stanford who champions the British Empire as the anti-Dietrich, rightly did remark, no Facebook, no Trump. Which goes to show even a stuck clock can be right two times a day. Zuckerberg's not only enabled Trump to ride to power, along with Russian hacking, but he's also helped demagogues around the world. Those inciting riots in India or genocide in Myanmar have used WhatsApp and Facebook to deadly effect. Numerous newspapers from the Daily Telegraph to the Washington Post, or Post rather, they've described how dictators use and love Facebook. And by the way, when David Ian Long, the man who said he was bored while killing people on Facebook, When he entered on social media that he hopes people calls him insane, he did so on Instagram, which was a social media venue that I've already deconstructed on my transmissions in the past. But when it comes to Facebook, to return to that Jew trash piece of shit, Mark Zuckerberg, who's got our general hospital in San Francisco named after him at this point in history, and of course is buying up an enormous amount of property in Kauai, the home of our volcano crown princess of the pacific our pacific correspondent judith agu who can speak to what he does over there at some point in the near future perhaps even with his trying to buy up all of Kauai, nowhere has his company facebook been more toxic than in the birthplace of our brother in battle daniel arola the philippines By offering free basic internet services in the Philippines, Facebook has become the window to the world for 69 million Filipinos. 
The company's created a society where the truth no longer matters, propaganda is ubiquitous, and lives are destroyed and people die as a result. Facebook treats the Philippines as an absentee landlord might, occasionally dropping by to address minor issues, but off shrudging off responsibility for the larger, more problematic crises. It's an uncomfortable fact that no dictator, even Duterte of the Philippines, who has killed at this point tens of thousands of people with the help of Facebook, not even he wields the amount of power that Zuckerberg does. No leader rules over a realm as vast as he or knows as much about so many people as a, the Zook, what I call Zuckerberg does. Facebook's company page, when I look at it, tells me that it had 1.47 billion daily active users on average for June 2018 and 2.23 billion monthly active users for that same month when I'm looking past past records. This beats the number of Christians, Muslims, or Hindus who show up at churches, mosques, or temples to pray. This book is the cult of disinformation paid for by motherfucking Russia under Vladimir Putin is influenced by Michael Aquino. Facebook may have lost 120 billion United States dollars in market capitalization on July 26, roughly 20% of its value, but billions of people still use Facebook and Facebook-owned platforms such as WhatsApp and Instagram on a daily basis. In the past, emperors and priests in positions of power became a law unto themselves. This probably led to the Ori adage that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The Emperor of Zuck. Sucking fucking Zuckerberg is no exception. He's the big boss of the new British East India Company. On September 17th, the New Yorker published a wordy piece by Evan Osnos titled, Can Mark Zuckerberg Fix Facebook Before It Breaks Democracy? Now, Osnos, the author... O-S-N-O-S is his surname. Osnos has done a fair bit of research on the Zuck, but like many American journalists, he cravenly genuflects before the rich and powerful. Explicit in the headline is the assumption that Facebook is about to break democracy and that only Zuckerberg can save it by fixing his Frankenstein. Trump, Congress, and over 235 million voters in the United States or the many billions in their leaders elsewhere are obviously incapable of doing so. Osnos shares this belief in the benevolence of Zuckerberg with hundreds of millions, if not billions of people. Sadly, this popular belief lacks a solid foundation. I live where Zuckerberg maintains an estate. He's shown up at some of the parties I've attended when my surrogate son's own husband, Sugar Daddy, was really cutting loose. So at the end of the day, I can tell you from having talked to the monster himself, I doubt he remembers it. Facebook is a for-profit company. Zuckerberg has majority voting rights thanks to a dual-class share structure that leaves him in complete control. He may spout homilies to human rights, community, and connecting people, but his fiduciary duty is to maximize returns to shareholders. Like the British East India Company before him, he may care for people in his empire because of altruism or enlightened interest, but he's responsible only to his shareholders and accountable only to himself just as the British East India Company did some positive things. So does Facebook. Yet Zuckerberg is akin to the robber barons of yore who made fortunes from people's addictive behavior. Opium was the drug of choice for the British East India Company. Social attention is what brilliance of people crave today. And like opium, it turns out this addiction is negatively associated with well-being. These are not observations of aging grandparents, but of an extensive study published in the American Journal of Epidemiology, bringing us back to the disease of mass murder as a medical phenomenon. As in earlier generations, teenagers are most at risk. Professor Jean M. Twenge of San Diego State University has found that teens tend to report symptoms of depression when they spend more time on smartphones. They also feel more unhappy the more they use Facebook. Teens are sleeping less, reading fewer books and news articles, and reducing their engagement with the real world. 
The spiking rates of depression and suicide among teens are proof of an acute mental health crisis that Zuckerberg insists on turning a Nelson's eye to. Facebook is like the British East India Company in another important way. It's colonized a country as populous as India, a continent as vast as Africa, and even a democracy as robust as the United Kingdom of Greater Britain. A member of the Competition Commission of India confessed to this, to this phenomenon that he felt impotent and depressed because Facebook would not even bother to answer his letters. Giving him information to investigate collusion or other anti-competitive practices was out of the question. Indubitably and incontrovertibly true that Facebook pays scant regard to concerns, challenges, problems of the billions of darker skinned natives who inhabit its global realm. And it's not surprising Osnos records that Zuckerberg is fascinated, if not fixated, by Emperor Augustus. He quotes Zuckerberg as crediting the really harsh approach of Caesar Augustus for 200 years of world peace. Zuckerberg may have married a lady of Chinese origin, one of my own sisters, if you will, of Sinoviet ethnicity. But he is a classic privileged white man who married an Asian girl the way all the white supremacists do out of their own insecurities. And of course, latent pedophilia because they're all flat chested so much so you can land a glider on their chest. You always feel like you're fucking somebody 12 years old. So this privileged white man who engages in this pedophile fantasy, fucking a Chinese MD who got our San Francisco General Hospital named Zuckerberg after him. He conflates the Roman Empire with the entire world. He also finds the violence of Augustus and his successors worthwhile because it supposedly brought peace to the world, enforcing Pax Romanum, the peace of Rome, a garrison state, a precursor to Stalinism, wherein perhaps the Gauls, the Goths, and even Jesus would disagree. Like Augustus, however, Zuckerberg's desire to win goes beyond anything. Your Christian God can discourage him from. His desire to win is legendary. In the early days of Facebook, when its motto was move fast and break things, Zuckerberg ended meetings with a war cry, domination. He's commented on the zero sumness of network effects, which translates simply as winner takes all. Facebook's high value depends on everyone in your circle being on it. Then you can post photos for all your friends to see. You can invite them to parties you host and you can target ads to the exact audience you target. It's important to note that Sub-Saharan Africa, India, China, and Southeast Asia do not register in Zuckerberg's view of the past. In Adam Fisher's Valley of Genius, Ezra Callahan muses how the direction of the internet was influenced by well-off white boys. Valley of Genius, of course, referring to the title of the book being about Silicon Valley, as authored by the authoress Ezra Callahan. And these well-off white boys, today, with... Sheryl Sandberg leaning in, Facebook and the direction of the internet is determined by powerful white men still and a few white women who pay scant regard to blacky natives, brownie fuzzy wuzzies and yellow chinkies in the same vein as the big bosses of the British East India Company. It's all about lying, lobbying and largesse to weaken democracy. If Emperor Zuckerberg was only causing damage to the likes of India, Myanmar and the Philippines, those in the developed world could ignore the perils of Facebook. Tragically, the company and other social media giants threaten American democracy itself. None other than Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay, and one of the pioneers of the Internet has made this argument because Facebook, more than others, has facilitated the rise of echo chambers, fake news, hate, and more. Not only Omidyar, but also former confidants of Zuckerberg are worried about Facebook. Shamath Halihatia, obviously Asian Indian, Pali Hapitiya, the former vice president of user growth, has observed the short-term dopamine-driven face feedback loops that we have created are destroying how society works. No civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. And Shamath, his first name is easier for me, has candidly admitted that he feels tremendous guilt. He thinks we all knew in the back of our minds that something bad was going to happen. And Sean Parker, the glamorous first president of Facebook, immortalized in the movie The Social Network, 
He's described the company's expertise as exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. In his own words, its goal is how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible? More time and attention translate into more advertisements, leaving the likes of Zuckerberg, Sandberg, and Facebook shareholders laughing all the way to the bank. In its pursuit of growth, time, attention, and money, Zuckerberg, Sandberg, and company have been less than economical with the truth. In an article for Slate magazine, Will O'Ramus examined Zuckerberg's recent testimony to Congress and parsed out five of the emperor's most dishonest answers. Now, to be fair to Zuck, he finally admitted not taking a broad enough view of our responsibility and not dealing with fake news, foreign interference in our elections. If you can imagine him admitting to that, foreign interference in our elections and hate speech and data privacy adequately. He didn't adequately deal with these, you know, hate speech, data privacy. You know, all your information going to a bunch of white trash national supremacists who are going to kill you. Shit like that. It's inadequate. Furthermore, Zuckerberg apologized, a pattern he's followed since 2003, mind you, that I've noticed, living in area. In a tour de force in Wired magazine earlier this year, for instance, I remember Zeynep Tufeki examining Zuckerberg's apologies over a period of 14 years. During this period, Facebook used 700,000 people as guinea pigs to do mood manipulation experiments, finding that emotions on social media are contagious and can lead to things like, you know, mass shootings spreading like a disease that you can catch by looking at a computer screen. Facebook launched the news feed without any notice to anyone when it conducted this experiment. It violated people's privacy repeatedly with wanton abandon. In case Facebook's actions caused too much outrage, Zuckerberg offered a tepid apology, but stayed calm and carried on. And by 2008, Kifeki points out that all of Zuckerberg's four posts on Facebook blog were apologies. By 2010, Zuckerberg, who himself is elusive to everyone except close friends and family, in any normal situation, other than a few I've been in, he declared privacy to be no longer a social norm. You see, it's become like, shall we say, Japan now. In Japan, there's no native word for the concept of privacy. He's saying that here in the West, you should eliminate that concept too. Zook's subjects, addicted to dopamine hits of incessant attention, voted in his favor by continuing to use his medium and post ever-increasing amounts of personal information. Only with President Trump's victory and the exposition of Russian interference in the U.S. elections did Zuckerberg feel some real for the very first time. And, of course, this heat did not prove to be too high because it turned out that Congress is still in awe of this young Jewish billionaire. Sadly, the Senate kowtowed before the Jewish Emperor Zuck instead of holding his feet to the fire. One senator kicked off the hearing by calling Facebook pretty extraordinary. Another did not even know that the company sold advertisements. And one asked Zuckerberg, what regulations should Congress draft for his company? Asked him, what regulations should Congress draft for him? The hearing was absolutely risable and demonstrated that Congress did not only not understand Facebook, making any regulation improbable, if not impossible, but showed that money talks. That's another little matter that makes Congress impotent in the face of Zuckerberg. Money plays a big role in American politics, and Zuck has a few billion United States dollars in his back-ass pocket. His friends are also no more poor than he. Besides, the United States believes in the cult of success. Any entrepreneur who's made many billions commands reverence. Therefore, in the heart of the world's most powerful democracy, Zuckerberg can afford to be cursory in his apology and crow that Facebook is an idealistic and optimistic company, despite his much checkered past. And the emperor knows that people will believe him even without his clothes. Such is the power of Facebook that popular leaders like Barack Obama and... Narendra Modi have made their way to Facebook to pay obeisance to the Jewish emperor of the world, Mark Zuckerberg, Obama and Modi of India, of pinup models of the left and the right in the world's two biggest democracies. Yet both of them found Zuckerberg's stardust useful for their electoral prospects. 
With so many people addicted to Facebook, most politicians are mortally afraid of upsetting Facebook. After all, they use Facebook to reach their voters, canvas donors, organize their campaigns. And Facebook's also playing the traditional lobbying game, not only in Washington, but also in other capitals of the world. The company spent nearly four million United States dollars, 3.67 million to be exact, on lobbying the second quarter of 2018. In addition, unlike other tech giants, Facebook has an ace up its sleeve. Sandberg is frighteningly savvy number two, went to Harvard for both her undergraduate and business degrees. She worked for Larry Summers, the key aide of Bill Clinton, infamous for his arrogance, cozy ties with Wall Street, and aggressive financial deregulation. Sandberg's as smooth as silk. She's rumored to have political ambitions. Unsurprisingly, she packs an iron fist under a velvet glove. She reportedly told James P. Steyer when he expressed concerns about children using social media that the best thing for young kids was to spend more time on messenger kids. In a virtuoso performance before the Senate Intelligence Committee, Sandberg cloaked herself in patriotism and spoke of an arms race against opponents to protect democracy. And senators purred demurely in approval before this white bitch. Facebook's also adapting the revolving door employment policy that once made Goldman Sachs and McKinsey infamous. For instance, Robert Rubin, Hank Paulson, and many others moved from Goldman Sachs to the U.S. Treasury and returned to cushy jobs on Wall Street when they retired. The Obama White House was full of bright young things from McKinsey with no dirt under the fingernails. Now Zuckerberg pays the salaries of the likes of David Plouffe, Obama's former campaign chief, and Annie Sharamam, one of Obama's speechwriters. Even as Facebook becomes more powerful, there's fewer and fewer journalists there to hold its feet to the fire. Few people read these days. Even fewer pay to read. Content is free and news media is in mortal danger. There's little money left for investigative or independent journalism. Even when hard-hitting articles are published, they rarely get much attention because people are almost incessantly distracted on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and Tinder. In 2014, the Pew Center found that there were five jobs in public relations for every job in journalism. Public relations was the job George Norrie had when he was in the U.S. Navy. Now his type of job, spin doctoring, outnumbers, factual reporting, five to fucking one. This year, that ratio is definitely worse. And some estimate it to be 8 to 1, if not higher. Probably 10 to 1 is what I would say conservatively. Tellingly, Zuckerberg told Osnos that he mostly reads news aggregators. The Jew emperor neither browses many news websites, nor does he pick up any newspaper and read it front to back. He doesn't need to. The Zuck can hire all the public relations professionals to spin the news, making him look brilliant, brave, and benevolent. Before too long, President Trump will be out of office. He's too fucking old, too goddamn erratic, and too incredibly unpopular. Even if he wins a second term, there's an expiry date to his reign. Meanwhile, the Jew Emperor Zuck can rule his realm till his dying day, hiring smooth operators, buying electric representatives, buying elections, avoiding scrutiny, influencing the people themselves. In our brave new world, our grave new world, eats the cool and calculating Jewish emperor Zuck that's far more sinister than the blusterous and blundering Donald Trump. And he the Jew pieces of shit have been indoctrinated to hate George Soros. That brings us to our brother at the end of this hour, J-Mo. J-Mo Reese, who I could only respond to on YouTube because his position was uh, brought to me there by Rose Dio, and I can't reach him on Facebook (laughs) because he deactivated his timeline. He says this, the constitutional literalists, that's what he's referring to, or even biblical literalists, are quite scary. But he's speaking constitutional. Having at one point listened to the alternative right media, book, I found almost a scary anger towards the abolition of slavery by some of them, if not all of them on the alt-right. It's almost like they regret not having someone to torment. I don't consider the literalist humans in this regard, and as a person of color, it's even more frightening, very frightening, as this nation always has been. If those of European descent want to be rid of invaders... Forgive my common sense, but since they aren't indigenous American, 
they of European descent ought to be rid of themselves first, if this is their stance. Words cannot express the cowardice of the white American male shooters of defenseless victims. What those of white descent in America need to know is if we of color wanted them dead, they wouldn't be alive right now to do what they do. I mean not to speak of a racial charge, but the fact of the matter is when you're one who can be shot by them at any day, at any time, the anger towards that bullshit they spout will be a natural response. So I thank JMO for that. And of course, this brings us to the fact that with the firing of Jess Sessions, he is forced turning in of resignation. Trump will only get more dangerous. And of course, the Republicans' midterm defeat, which I'll get to in more detail in our next transmission, has made Trump more desperate to undermine the rule of law. But at the base of it all, what brought up, what is brought up by J. Mo Reese is the point that needs to be taken as we end this transmission, which is the fact that America does not have a problem of tribalism that people keep mentioning. What America has a problem of is racism. Now, I'll go a bit more into that problem of the disambiguation between the two on Wednesday, because it's so important to our survival as a nation that we understand that dynamic. For now, let me see, five, six, six, seven, seven, eight, eight, nine, four hours. I'll stop your beating for tonight. My love to all my supporters. A slow, torturous death and degradation to all my gang stalkers and detractors who have always tried to impose such on myself and those that I love. And until Wednesday, stay safe, stay alert, be aware of those who are taking advantage of you and enjoying your death while they strive to kill you as a culture, as a nation. Your enemies are Russia and the Republicans and all independent party or anarchist or libertarian who have emboldened them and expedited their path to dominion. Your enemies are the alternative media. Only Douglas Dietrich has spoken against the alternative media for what it is. And yet he's in the alternative media because it's the only place where he can be. All those in power will never dare to say his name. So it's up to you to spread the word of Douglas Dietrich. Thank you. Good night.